confirm if it's recording. Well, um, I'm we had to see and um, notify me of the same, but uh, not yet. How about okay. now? That's okay. That's okay. Thank you. Noah, welcome. Oh, Rida, I, I don't know if you could hear me. Yes, I could hear. I can hear you. Great, great. Thank you. Um, uh, so welcome. So the paper was sent out, and uh, before we we begin, I could perhaps uh, give Sulok and Noah some two minutes to say uh, something before we start the ball rolling. So uh, Sulok, then Noah, and then you we can kick start this. Okay. <clears throat> Hi everyone, I uh, hope you had a good week and a wonderful session this week as you prepare for your exams. So, now mine is just to say, um, you have time, you have time. We've been getting our SMSs, calls, but what I can say is you have time and um, with better preparation, you'll test the exam. Now, in this unit that we're doing today, it's uh, legal writing and drafting. Now, I think that this is a fairly easy unit to pass more so for the ladies because <clears throat> they are more inclined towards keen attention to detail. So they have keen attention to detail. So this is a unit where you get to lose marks because you don't have a full stop or a comma. These are unit where when you're told to do or to draft a bill, you put a certain word in small letters instead of putting it in caps and you fail to get marks for it. This is a unit where you're told to draft a legal opinion and you go straight to answer in the question and you don't put the letterhead, you don't put your, your ref or your ref, or you mistakenly, instead of writing yours faithfully, you write yours sincerely, you lose marks for it. And uh, it's one of the te technical units. So people are usually afraid of the four heavy Cs, but in real sense, this is one of the tricky units that uh, needs a lot of preparation and a lot of uh, keen attention to detail. And the only way you can pass or you can get good marks for this unit is through practice and practice and practice. So for instance, in bill, before you sit for the exams, at least attempt to draft several bills before sitting for that paper. At least attempt to draft certain contracts before you sit for that paper. Because if you look at our paper last, uh, last year, I think for the LWD paper, all the questions were drafting questions apart from one minute. I think apart from one question, if I'm not wrong, apart from one question. So picture this. You have, uh, how many papers? They're usually, they're usually like uh, five, six questions. Huh? You're supposed to do five. Now, in those six questions, you have part A, part B. So you have number one, A, B, two, A, B, three, A, B. The tricky thing with LWD last year, I think that was one of the hardest units last year for the ATP program, was that they brought drafting questions. So you have number one A, okay, let's say two A, you're told draft a legal opinion in two A. Two B, draft this. Another question, number three, draft this, draft this, draft. So you didn't, if you didn't have speed, you'd end up filling the paper because you wouldn't uh, managed to finish answering the questions. And we had, I had some of my colleagues after finishing the paper, some were saying, you know, I only reached number three. I wasn't able to complete the paper. I drafted a bill and that bill took me one hour to draft. I didn't finish that paper. I only did this number of questions. I didn't finish that paper. Like a majority of people didn't finish that paper because of uh, the technicality of the questions. So the tips to this unit as we, like normally before we begin, we usually give you tips. For example, in commercial, I told you the tips to commercial, conveyancing the same. The tips to this unit is practice and practice and practice and uh, keeping it simple and uh, listening to the lecturer's instructions. So if the lecturer says do this or draft, um, like when you're drafting adhere to this particular format, then make sure you do it. Otherwise, it's a fairly easy unit. Uh, it's, uh, this is a uh, it's not easy, healing lemia, but uh, it's manageable and it's workable, and I believe you will, you will pass. So for today, Levins will take us through the paper, and then uh, next week, Noah will do a paper so that at least we don't hog all the time, but we are here to answer all the questions uh, 
together. So if you have a question, you can post to any of us. Today we'll do, Lavins will do LWD, Noah will do another paper next week, and then now we be revolving, but now we are assisting each other so that you gain from the pool of knowledge from all of us. Because the way I answer my questions is different from the way Noah answers his, and it's different from the way Noah uh, Lavins answers his. So we're here to assist and uh, feel free, feel free to engage, ask questions, chat box. If you shy, you can type the question in the chat box and uh, so forth. Otherwise, hope we'll have a lovely session today and then uh, we'll move forward. What I assure you is before we do the paper, we'll go through several, pers before you sit for your paper, we'll go through several past paper questions and you will have a gist on uh, how to answer questions and how to approach them. And then you'll see that these things are workable and these things are easy. Like when we did commercial, you saw how commercial was easy, but at the same time technical and uh, paying keen, keen attention to detail. So participate and uh, feel free. Uh, thank you, Lovins. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Solonka. Noah, could you perhaps uh, take the floor? Uh, okay, good evening. Uh, with regards to LWD, uh, personally, I really uh, enjoyed this unit in campus, in, not in campus, in KSL. The reason as to why I did this is because I had a tendency to enjoy doing uh, uh, drafting. I enjoyed drafting. So what I can tell you for now is that uh, with regards to LWD and uh, generally KSL, and there is a common de uh, denominator among the three of us, given that we uh, we passed the bar exams and our, in one sitting is that uh, we are all happy. And uh, what I can say is that the, uh, the three of us, including Sumaya and uh, Alex, is that, you know, Perhaps, uh, you know, happiness is the real sense of uh, ful fulfillment that comes as a result of um, hard work. So what you can do is just, you know, just wake up in the morning, you know, take your 20 minutes, try and draft a demand letter. Then you do some affidavits, one or two. These are just things you can do in 15, 20 minutes. Then uh, at the end of the day, when once you do that, uh, uh, if your dream is, you know, to pass by exams, then all you have to do is work hard. At the end of the day, LWD is always about practice, nothing much more. It's always about, it's not a matter of using your brain. It's just a matter of using your your hand. So at the end of the day, if you, wa if you want to pass LWD, all you have to do is keep on practicing this term, especially term two work. Uh, normally they come in the uh, optional question. And probably question one, if you are lucky or unlucky enough, given that you have not practiced, depending on how much you have practiced, uh, you might end up getting the bill. And let me tell you something. If there is something that uh, personally I got lucky in that exam, uh, everything that I read came in that exam. And I can tell you for sure, because uh, one of the units that I expected not to pass was LWB, because... Uh, you know, we did not do uh, class C, but in general, we did not do well in uh, in LWD uh, project work. Most of us, we were just getting 9, 10, 11, you know. And then uh, if you are not lucky in the orals, then everything was not going well for you. So I expected that unit, given that it was actually, it was the last, the worst performing unit in our project. Uh, I had to work an extra mile to ensure that I passed that particular unit. So luckily, uh, in that exam, uh, that was the highest performing exam I did out of all the units. Uh, I managed, I think, 50 something out of 60. So it's possible if you just practice. Me, 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 LWD, I never used my brain. All I could see is the question, what they want. Then I sit down and start drafting. And uh, 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 what you have to do is to be very careful. Uh, because this is now where basic English, uh, the nine parts of speech work. So you have to be very careful, the wordings, you know, you have to be as simple as possible. Like, you just write as a class three, uh, grade three mem, uh, when answering that question. So you be as simple as possible, read the question carefully, do a lot of drafting, 
that is why it is called legal drive, uh, writing and drafting. You have to do a lot of drafting to reach, to pass that by exam. Otherwise, the, uh, in that particular unit, uh, a lot of theory was not there. It was just a matter of practice. That's all uh, Lavin's. Thank you, Noah. Um, I believe to those who have ears of lesson, to those who are the sixth sons, you know, they have incorporated what both my colleagues have mentioned. Well, for me, before I, I begin now going through this paper, LWD um, is the easiest unit to pass, and then is also the easiest unit to fail. Reason, uh, reasons have been espoused by both of my colleagues. You have LWD is an art. Okay, so um, if LWD itself is an art, then that only means that not everyone is an artist because uh, at the end of the day, you'd find people ignoring perhaps what color will make this particular image looks best. Okay, or maybe some wouldn't even dare risk to have their paint brushes broken. So it's upon you to learn and master the art and craft of this particular unit because um, it's an interesting unit. It was my second best unit at Castle after conversing, and no one out here. If you are a lawyer, you know, you ought to know how to draft. That's that's all. So if uh, you don't have that particular skill, then there is something that is perhaps missing or lacking within you, and you ought to perfect that particular art. So before I go to the paper, um, I just want to ask you if you know how, because it's not only a bill, because I saw the first question, you know, talks about a bill. Well, this was a 2017 paper, and um, the first question was about a bill. Well, our question last year, the first question was also a bill. And before we did our exams, you know, uh, Mr. Laivota, who was our lecturer, uh, told us that these guys won't set a bill. Okay, that's what they told us. So everyone bought, majority bought into that particular idea. But as a diligent student, you ought to know that you can't ignore any drafting, regardless of notwithstanding what your lecturers have told you, you have to go deeper and understand exactly what that particular drafting is all about. So a day before we did our LWD exams, um, I used to uh, revise or study with uh, my, my group of friends from, from campus, so we came all the way to Kassel, so we were, we were discussing, and I told them just out of the blues that, you know, we are in a pandemic, and uh, CLE might, you know, might just bring us a bill to draft a COVID-19 bill. I just said it out of the blues, you know, there's that gut feeling within you. There's always that inner voice that tells you something may just happen, but you're not sure, but you have a feeling it could happen. But the next day when, uh, uh, we went for the paper at COP Uni um, in current there. We were told, well, the first question you open, and uh, you see it's a bill. I looked at my friends and I smiled. I told them, well, the universe has aligned. It was a COVID-19 bill. But because we had that particular, you know, uh, suspicion, you know, before the exams, we went through how to draft a bill. Actually, it was myself who took them through the structure of drafting. And I used specifically the COVID-19. What provisions could be incorporated in a COVID-19 bill? Okay, so whatever you speak into existence might just somehow turn out to be true. So it's up to you. If you want to juggle your carrots before the hares and rabbits, or if you want to keep cultivating more to harvest more, okay? So a bill might still be repeated. You know, K is, sorry, not Castle. CLE has no formula of setting any exam. They might just decide we are still in a pandemic. Well, last year group drafted a COVID-19 bill. That was the foundation. Well, we have, you know, um, 
a number of developments that have taken place before, you know, after 2020, or the way we are now in 2022, COVID-19 is still with us. So what kind of provisions could still be incorporated into this bill? Okay, we have now the booster shots, we have, you know, um, uh, we have the task force to look into this. You see, we have a number of things going on going on. So the CLE may decide, well, it doesn't hurt. You still ask the same question, but we want a different structure of answering this particular question. So before I begin now, I'd like to ask you if you know how to draft a demand letter, if you know how to draft a contract like Salon Convention, if you know how to draft different affidavits. We have like seven or so affidavits. You have uh, you have a verifying affidavit, you have supporting affidavit, you have supplementary affidavit, you have a, a, a further supplementary affidavit, you have affidavit for lost documents. Like you lose your ID right now, your KSL ID, and CLE tells you, okay, how would you replace this ID? Or you lose your national ID, or you lose your birth certificate, or even you lose your, your degree certificate and you want to replace this, what's the procedure? Will you cite the relevant laws? Okay, you know, it's all about widening the scope. Don't so much rely on what you guys have been taught, in, you know, in class, try to go an extra mile because the next mile itself is actually never crowded. So it's up to you to decide, do you want to do this? Remember, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to sit for the bar exams. So you have one bullet. Will you miss the target or will you hit the spot? So the first question, back to the question. Anyone please read the question? Uh, do you need me to present the question? Yes, please. I'll appreciate it. Welcome. Here it is. Uh, can you see the cushion? It's on my screen. I to the uh, is it visible? I can't see anything. I don't know. Solonka, which paper is that what you are projecting? Because what was sent to the group was the November 2017 paper. Oh, this is? LWD November 2017 paper. Oh, okay, let me get the 2017 paper, sorry. Yes, you can just send it to the group. Okay. Somebody send, send it to the group so I don't know it. It's in the group, actually. Okay, let me do it. Yeah, just just extract it from the group and then our uh, product. It is. You got it. Uh, is it this one of Maltopia? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, it's on the screen. Anyone else, perhaps, to just read? I'll be following through. I think I don't know why my screen isn't projecting the same, but uh, well. 
anyone just just read the question there. Unmute and then just read. Can I read Lavins? Okay. No worries. Uh, go ahead, Wanyamu. Uh, okay. Question one: The country of Mantopia is located south of south of Manchuria on the African continent. After elections in 2012, the president, His Excellency Mavuna, led a successful referendum to amend the constitution and extend the presidential term from four to nine years. Many citizens of Mantopia were not disappointed, but were also angry at the blatant disregard for the hard and constitutional freedoms. They were equally frustrated at President Mavuna's rigging during the referendum. Khalifa, a young man of 35 years who was a student leader at a local university in Mantopia, recently announced that he will vie for presidency in 2021 when President Mavuna's term comes to an end. Mavuna and his supporters are afraid of losing elections to the young man. The immediate fear, which is bigger than that of losing the elections, is that the country could plunge into violence. The constitution of Mantopia is held as the best in Africa with the most expansive bill of rights. The only negative clause is that, is that which extends the presidential term from four years to nine years. Out of fear, desperation, and political inexperience, Khalifa was counseled by his advisors that if he organized what they refer to as harmless violence, the, cit the citizens will succumb to panic, blame the government, and vote for him in mass come 2021. When the government got wind of the plan, the, the leadership decided to follow the rule of law in order to protect public safety. Since this kind of situation was unprecedented, the government realized that there was a need to set up an institution which will be responsible for investigating conduct that is injurious to the public order, safety, and well-being of the citizens of Mantopia. There was also a need to allow the state to detain persons in situations where it was felt that they were a danger to the society. It was noted that Khalifa was extremely active on social media. While none of, none of his communication on social media was blatantly spreading violence, the state was concerned that Khalifa did not know the extent of his freedom of expression. The investigative organ to be created was supposed to ensure capacity with respect to the choice of political violence. However, in order to ensure that their capacity is supplemented by what existed in the criminal justice system in, of Mantopia, the highest body had to have the membership or a representation of the DPP, mm. the Forensics Bureau of Mantopia, a, rep a reputable civil society organization that deals with criminal justice and a representative of the Mantopia Law Society. It is important to note that the criminal law in question should be considered as a specific component of the criminal justice as contained in the penal code of Mantopia. You work for the state law office as a parliamentary counsel in Mantopia. You have received instructions to draft a bill to be tabled in parliament in three weeks' time. The, will, the bill is intended to take care of the concerns of the government that arise out of this scenario. Using the facts provided, draft the most appropriate legislative instruments. You may be, you may be creative where necessary to accommodate facts without which the legislative sentences cannot exist. The closest drafted should be restricted to the following. The most appropriate heading for the bill, the most appropriate long title, substantive sections touching only on the enforcement of the bill, the sections establishing a relevant body for the facts given. All right, um, thanks. Okay, so first question. Um, draft the appropriate heading of this particular bill. Well, you went through the question, so I would like us, because I'm only here to guide you, what do you think, bearing the facts of this particular case, what could be the appropriate heading of the bill? Just a try before, before we agree on what exactly should be the right answer. 
What do you think is the appropriate heading of this particular paper? Anyone? Um, you answer the question. The question has been read a second time, so. Yes, uh, Timothy. Good evening, Lavins. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can. Uh, please proceed. All right, all right. So, uh, uh, I would uh, go with the public order bill because uh, this bill is aimed at containing uh, containing an arrest that may occur uh, post election. So, uh, uh, in order to uh, in order to contain that, they, uh, the government is seeking to have an act of parliament that is going to criminalize such actions. So, I'll just go with the public order bill. Thank you. Right, that's a nice trial. I can see B the Calvin. Uh, please trial. Yes, um I would have also gone with the public order bill. So it's been said. All right. So um Before anything, um, when it comes to to a bill, okay, um, after all the drafting, you know, instructions have been perhaps fully understood, comprehended. You know, the next step is always what we call um, the legislative scheme. I don't know if you guys have been told about a radiate castle. So, a legislative scheme is a is a is a plan, you know, for the particular act or bill which you're trying to draft. Anyway, it's an act. So any provision after that will still be under the title of a bill, but it has to be a sanctity. But for this particular purpose, it's just for academic purpose. So this legislative scheme is a plan for the act itself, you know, following the practice of that particular jurisdiction. So in our jurisdiction, we have it's a Kenyan jurisdiction. So now you as the drafter, you know, you have to put in what we call a logical sequence, you know, of the provisions of the law. And that one will start on the title of this particular bill. That's where that question is as it is. The first part of any question is about the title of that particular bill. Okay. So by doing this, you know, I mean, it could be done by listing, you know, the head notes, which I think will come, you know, uh, to learn about. So you have to list the hard notes and these may actually reveal the gaps in the instructions. So now that we have um, agreed, because I think that's, uh, that's a, a title I would uh, also go with, you know, it is meant to sort of restore, preserve and maintain sanity, okay, when it comes to enforcement of orders. And it is a bill that's going to fight the rest of the public. So yeah, public order bill will suffice as the appropriate title. And that's it. It's two marks. So yeah, question two. What does question two say? Uh, just, just a question. Um, uh, maybe Noah can also come in. Do you have to put an in, like, how, how can I put it? Like the year behind it, like public order bill, and then comma, and then uh, 2021, 2018, like similarly to how other bills are usually structured. Let me just like, open it. Yes, um, absolutely. Because now this bill, assume the guys from 2017 were, you know, are drafting this bill, that's it. Because the bill is for that particular year. Okay, so you have a public order bill. Um, I don't know if we could put because Parliament itself has the what we call legislative 
you know, notes or numbers attached to it. It could be Senate bills, it could be National Assembly bills, number this, this, this. So you have a public order bill, 2017, that's fine. Yeah, so I think that's, that one will work. So maybe perhaps that second mark will be on that uh, year. Yeah, so don't forget, guys, the year upon which you draft in this said bill, it has to have that. So you have the public order bill, comma. See where the comma is? 2021. So LWD is about, you know, punctuation. You could go back and uh, start revising your English aid class three, four, two backwards. So long as you turn to understand exactly what, how, why you should use this particular um, punctuation. So yeah. So the second question. Part two. Lavis, I'm not sure you can see the hands. Mm -hmm. Lavis, can you see the hands? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't love it either. Yes, yes. Uh, sorry. Um, Wanyama. Yeah. I was saying before you answer, Wanyama, sorry. Before you answer, I was saying um, a bill has a long title and the bill has a short title. So in this case, they want you to come up with a long title. And a long title will always come beneath the title of that particular bill. So bearing the facts given, in that particular question, and I say it and I still repeat, never at any given time use facts that have not been given to draft a bill. So back to you, Wanyama. Oh, I wanted to make an attempt on, on the long title. Uh, the attempt is that maybe the long title will be a bill for an act to to provide for responsible conduct. Uh, you, you can input the, the wordings of paragraph four. My eyes can see clearly, but the, the main factor is that that first part must be there. And bill for an act to provide, then you give a brief description of what the bill is supposed to talk about. You are breaking. I couldn't hear you. Please repeat. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm saying yes. The the the, the most important thing when writing the the long title is to write a bill for an act to provide for. Then you give the brief description of what the bill is particularly talking about. So in our case, you may want to expand on why you are calling it the public order bill. So to expand on the reason, maybe you could input paragraph one, two, three, four, paragraph five, the wordings of paragraph five in your own way. All right, and uh, in your own way, how could you come up with that? Before I invite uh, Kimani Caroline to give exactly her own opinion. So you, Wanyama, what is your own way? I mean, how would you drop that pretty long title? That's exactly what I want. Oh, all right. A bill for an act to provide for, to provide for a body, sorry, for a body to, pro to provide for public order, safety, and well being of the citizens of Mantopia during the electioneering period. Well, a uh, good trial. Uh, Kimani Carolyn before uh, Marion Mushiri. So, Kimani. Um, thank you. 
So I've written down a bill for an act of parliament to establish the public service order board for the management of order in public spaces and for connected purposes. I, I thought um, establishing a public service order board would be in tandem with the fourth paragraph where the government realized that there was a need to set up an institution. And also I had a question in the, sh in the sorry to take you back, in the most appropriate heading, I'm seeing in other bills, it's in capital letters. So in an exam setting, do we have to write it in capital letters for the heading? Well, uh, I would uh, respond to that. Let me uh, take uh, other concerns and then I will uh, respond perhaps while they're consolidated. So anyone who had a trial on that part two of the question? Because the answer is just there on that particular question. You don't have to use any facts. Borrow the facts from that question and give me a long title. Before um, be the uh, June Easter, June Easter, you could make a trial. Um, thank you. So my attempt is a bill for an act of parliament to provide for the conduct, safety and well-being of the citizens of Mantopia and for connected purposes. <laughs> uh, uh, allow me to ask. Uh, June Esther, have you at any given time worked at Parliament or any consultancy firm that does drafting? Because that last part <laughs> of your that that last part of what you said basically is uh, that's the structure. Any bill, whether be it any emanating from the Senate, National Assembly, or even the County Assemblies, has those last two wordings. So June Esther, what do you have to say? We were taught uh, drafting the last <laughs> title in class wow, the other day. Okay. Uh, I see. Uh, great. Um, that's a fantastic uh, attempt. Uh, Wamboi Muturi, I'm coming back to you, Mbidi. Don't worry. Yes, thank you, Lavis. If I may, tr let me try. Um, a bill for an act of parliament. Um, for establishing um, just a minute. Oh, sorry, let me come again. A bill for an act of parliament uh, for uh, establishing an institution which which would be responsible for investigating conduct that is injurious to the public order, safety, and well-being of the citizens, uh, and for connected purposes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Muturi. Okay, now Calvin Bivy. Um, I have a bill for an act of parliament to establish the public order investigations agency, comma, to provide for the investigation of conduct that is injurious to the public order, safety, and well being of citizens. Comma, allow for detention of persons who are a danger to society, comma, and for connected purposes. Thank you. Um, well, I'd say all of you will have um, will have those two marks because you know when you when you look at what the examiner wants, he or she doesn't want you to to be verbose. And by the way, that's one thing you should never do. Please use um, use verbosity, use use legalese, use all those complex terms with me when you are away from get C, get A, or get B of Castle. Okay. So when you're doing an exam uh, by exam paper, especially LWD, leave those things at the door before you get, you know, to do that particular exams, because at the end of the day what the examiner wants are you able to communicate to the layman if he or she gave your paper to them would they understand what you're trying to talk about 
afterwards, once you are done with exams, well, come and use all those things out here. But for academic purpose, but for you to get your marks, please. Do exactly, you know, as you are taught, simple English. So all those um, attempts that you guys have made, well, uh, they're commendable and uh, I would agree because how you will phrase your answer will be different. But at the end of the day, you have to capture the heart and soul of that particular objective. We call them the memoranda and uh, reasons for the bill, reasons and objects of the bill. It normally comes at the end of a bill. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, before I move to question three, uh, I've seen a hand, uh, Kamal Wamboy. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can proceed. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I have a quick question. Uh, sorry for taking you back. Um, when you're writing the long title, I think it's because I've, I've had different examples. Um, the last example, um, I think it was from BP when he read his long title. Um, he had a lot of um, is it functions like in the title? OK, because I think before him, most of the people who are reading their examples, the, the thing that they were saying was that an act of parliament to establish um, something like the public order service board or service committee to provide for the safety and well-being of the citizens of Mantopia and for connected purposes. So they only had like one thing that they had written there um, Okay, when I say one thing, I mean that issue of providing safety and well-being for the citizens of Mantopia. But Mbithi's example had that and many other things. I think he also had something about detaining persons. Um, like many other examples that are in the question, he put them in the long title. So my question is, are you supposed to have, are you allowed to have like more than one thing? Like, will you be, um, is it what? Is it okay for you to have more than one function in uh, that you want that board to do in the long title, or is that verbose, or is that okay? Uh, yeah, just are there rules concerning that? Yeah, thank you. Well, if I got your question right, what you are trying to ask me and the rest of the students is whether you are allowed to perhaps. Um, which one should I use? You are allowed to um, to start. Yeah, I mean, you are you are perhaps the functions of the board that you're trying to establish on the long title of, of a bill. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, to say like more than one function. Yes. Like many functions in the long title, not just one thing. It isn't necessary because um, that's why we have clauses of uh, um, a bill. So in those clauses, you will enlist the title. Perhaps clause four should be, or section, it's a clause, section after the bill is assented to. So you have a clause four, establishment of that particular board, and then you have sub clauses, okay? You know, functions of the board, uh, uh, remuneration of the board members. Um, you have as well election uh, or uh, requirements or vacancy uh, on that particular board. You have, you see, I mean, things that are connected. So that's why we have the connected purposes there. You have those things underneath the main uh, clause. So it wouldn't be necessary. It uh, it will be. Um, you will easily make the examiner board. Yeah, uh, okay, so uh, mm -hmm. that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, just one last thing, sorry. Um, I, I was thinking it's just that I, I, I okay. Um, the title that we that we are using is the uh, public order bill. So I, I don't know, I think in my mind, I had thought about political violence, violence bill, like before people said public order bill. So I just wanted to know if is that still a good title? Like if you had said political violence bill instead of a public order bill? Or how do you know that you have coined the exact title 
that the examiner wanted? Because uh, mm -hmm. I would answer you in the simplest way possible. You aren't focusing on the problem. You are focusing on the solution that the bill intends to arrive at. If you structure and title your bill as that political violence bill or something, that title that you're trying to propose, well, there isn't any essence of you coming up with that bill. So when compared to a public order bill, you're trying to come up with ways of avoiding all those chaotic, you know, provisions that have been given on those facts of the case. Remember, a bill is meant to, you know, come up with a solution, not maintain the problem or the status quo. You know, understand? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Awesome. OK, any other concern? Just uh, just a small thing is uh, when drafting that thing, so the WDF is very particular. I remember like small things like how you put this wording, an act of parliament. This has to be in caps. Then parliament has to be in caps also. And then some in coma and then and for connected purposes. So they're usually particular about these small issues. Yes, um, uh, Solanka, thanks. I'm seeing another hand, Nkambe uh, Deche. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? I, I can, yeah, proceed. Yeah, I have a question. And um, does the long title include the enacting formula or you just put a full stop and leave the enacting formula out when you're doing the long title? What do you mean by enacting formula? Like there's that part enacted by the parliament of so and so. Miss Kungu told us it's called enacting formula. Yeah, the, the very after the word purposes, there's that part enacted by the parliament of Kenya as follows. So we were told it's called enacting formula. So is it a part and yes. parcel of the long title? Yes, it is because you know you you also have bills that are being enacted by the county assembly. You understand? Yeah. So to try and draw perhaps the distinction between the two, while well, it is advisable um, to do that. And then okay, you, you also have to look at the question critically because sometimes the examiner will lay a trap. This is perhaps, let's say, um, a problem that is quite you know, persistent and prevalent in the counties, but you are there rushing to draft a national legislation, you see? So by doing that, you are you are done already. There isn't any, you know, sense of me marking your paper because you are there drafting a national legislation while. So long, it seems Lavins has disappeared. But could you could you respond on the enacting whatever the first speaker has said? Could you please expound it using the long title? How will you input it? Uh, so please please repeat the question. Uh, hello. So long, can you hear can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I'm the one who was asking the question. 
like uh, the question is asking us to do a, an appropriate long title. So my question was, does the long title include an acting formula or in such a case, the long uh, the enacting formula is not a part and parcel of that long title. Oh, I get the question. Uh, so long. No, for me. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, yes. For me. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Uh, this is Marvin. Uh -huh. Yeah. Let, let me try to answer that. Um. Uh, okay. I go on. And I think that uh, that the long the long title. Is, uh, is separate and distinct from uh, the enacting formula because the main purpose of uh, a long title is to give a description of uh, the bill or maybe the the act. What what generally what the what the act or the bill is for. But you see, for for uh, an enacting formula, it's just like a, a normal statement uh, indicating which legislative authority. That may be the you know the. Uh, the parliament that is the National Assembly, either the National Assembly or the Senate uh, enacting that legislation. So th it's not the same thing. It's the, the different thing. And uh, usually it's usually it's it begins with the long title. Then uh, 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 just below it, there's the enacting formula. So they're not uh, the same thing and they're not found uh, like th th they're not in the same paragraph. There are different paragraphs and different, they mean different things. I, I, I actually do agree with him. So in my opinion, they're totally separate. There are two distinct things or features in a bill, and a long title is separate from the enacting formula, just as he, had, just as he has explained. And uh, it's self-explanatory. I don't know if you have this material, but I sent it to you and last year. But as you can see, this is a long title here now. This entire bit. Now, this is here enacted by the enacting formula, and there are two separate distinct things. So in that question, I will leave out the enacted by the Parliament of Kenya as follows. But I don't know, what did Ms. Kumo advise you on that? Uh, Miss, uh, if I may answer, because I'm in Miss Kungu's class, she taught them uh -huh. as two distinct uh, aspects. But then, just because it, it, it's, it's following the long title and it's kind of uh, speaking to what was above there, that's why I was asking in terms of exam purposes, where you're not drafting an actual, I mean, an entire bill, but a certain clauses given to you, uh, you should in that case have that particular uh, inactive formula. But I got it. It's it's what Mrs. Kungu said in class. Oh, OK, that's that's fine. That's fine. So uh, it's separate now for purposes of exams. I will uh, keep it short because since the saying is the long title, you know, if um, an exam, and you see the lecturers who mark LWD are usually extremely particular about things. If you put the enacting formula, I guess they will think that you can distinguish between the two of them. So to be safe, what I what I will do is uh, what I would advise is for you to just uh, stick to the long title and then leave it at that. Your last sentence will be end for connected purposes, and then you leave it at that. Um, hi, Esther, I can see your hand. Kimani Esther. Esther. Okay. Esther. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, I had a question. Um, from the question itself, I'm looking at um, the end of, you just scroll up, just at the end, just there. Using the facts provided, draft the most appropriate legislative instruments. You may be creative. Um, oh, sorry, let's read from you work for the state law. Um, you have received instructions to draft a bill to be tabled in parliament in three weeks' time. The bill, this bill is intended to take care of the concerns, blah, blah, blah. I feel like this whole drafting should have, like, it's it's continuous. I, I, I feel like we're addressing it as if it's breaking, like, part A, part B. Shouldn't we just write a continuous? A bill in its entirety, then leave it to, to them to just understand that there is an acting formula. There is there. How should you? I don't, like, I don't get why. Um, probably I stand guided. Do we have to break the question? 
or can we just write a whole bill and then leave it to them? See, so long as Omeona, it's a whole bill and it has the particular uh, items that which I stand guided. <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. I understand, I understand, I understand Soloka. the question. Soloka, no. can you hear me? Uh, are you back? Okay. Sorry, um, oh, I'm in. in. I'm in, sorry. My okay. wife is here misbehaving, but uh, I'm good. Um, you can hear me Let now, me... right? Let me answer. Yeah, I can hear you. Esther asked, oh, a, asked a question on uh, on oh, where. Sorry. Let me repeat the question. Esther. Esther mm -hmm. es, asked, 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 asked a question on yes. uh, whether it will be advisable for you to, now from the question here, using the facts provided, draft the, appro the most appropriate legis legislative instruments. You may be creative where necessary to accommodate facts without which the legislative sentences cannot exist. So they're asking, she was asking, sorry, ask, Esther was asking, should you break it off or you just draw, draft one comprehensive bill and then they can just get to pinpoint or just uh, award you marks based on one thing that you've drafted or should you break it up into bits where now, as we were doing now, you start by giving the appropriate heading for the bill and then the most appropriate long title and then you go on to the substantive sections and then you go into the sections establishing the relevant body from the facts. That was uh, her question. So should you break it off or should you just do something that is in pro pros? Well, um, um, I'm lost. Um, what exactly? Is, is it uh, based on uh, on the long title or something? Uh, no, no, OK. You remember our question last year on yes. drafting a bill? Yes. It didn't have, uh, it just said draft, uh, draft a bill, yeah? It didn't break it up into sections the way this one is, is uh, has been broken up into sections. Yeah? Yes. So for last year, what we did is we drafted an entire bill from the beginning. Like, you know, you just start drafting, uh, how can I put it? Let me open this bill. You start drafting, you see like the landlord and tenant bill, then you just draft the entire thing and then the examiner marks. That's yes. one way to do it. But yes. in this question, it's a bit different because it's yes. saying you should uh, restrict yes. yourself or should be the drafting, the clauses you draft should be restricted yes. to the following. Yes. So do you start first, you know, the most appropriate bill, maybe that's like a heading, you start there, give the appropriate bill, the public order bill slash 2022. Then you go on to the most appropriate bill, up the most appropriate long title, then you go to an act, a bill for an act of parliament and so forth. Like, do you break it up into bits or do you just do it in prose? Well, um, that's the well, um, personally, I will break it up into bits. If if I was okay. asked now, maybe I can agree. Huh? Okay, um, speak first. I'll ask you. Okay, no problem. Now, for me, if I was if I was uh, asked such a question, uh, if I was sitting for this paper, this is how I would approach it, and I. Don't say my answer is correct, but I'm, this is just how I would approach it. From this question, here are the marks. From this question, the marks are awarded uh, appropriately. So for me, I will just do as it is in the paper, and even with a black pen, I will say, oh, uh, the long title and then, uh, the short title, sorry, the most appropriate heading for the bill, then go on to the long title, then after that, go on to the substantive sections and list them, and then, the sections establishing a relevant body from the facts given. That's how I would approach it. I will break it up. I wouldn't just do something that is in, uh, just do an entire bill because that's not where the marks are. The marks are on the specifics. So I will go specifically to what they want. So I wouldn't touch on anything extra because one, that will waste on your that will waste your time in a you know, in an exam paper. Remember, this is only one drafting question. Last year we had all the questions being drafting questions. So it will take much of your time, and then you won't get marks for other extra things because that's not what the examiner wants. So you see, passing exams is a strategy. So you just give the examiner what they want. So if you if they see, you know, um, you've done the bill, the heading of the bill, well. Well and good, get a two marks. Long title, well and good, get a two marks. They are not interested in any other de small details there. You know, for example, you cannot mm. start, you cannot come in and start drafting the interpretations and general provisions. Uh, uh, not necessarily, but the interpretations are uh, provisions or the sections providing for the interpretation. 
competition. You won't come to this bit here. Chairperson means, commission means, parliamentary se select committee means, secretary means. Why? Because there's no marks under it. There's no marks whatsoever. Because they just want you to go into the substantive sections touching only on the enforcement. You see, on the enforcement. So they want you to go straight to the enforcement part of the bill. After you're done with that and you've gotten your eight marks, you go straight to the part where a body is being established. Now let's see if this part has a section where the body is being a body is being established. Yeah, there is a body here. Okay, let me see if there's a body. Okay, for this, I think it's a commission that was being established, but there are various acts where you will get bodies being established. So I will go into the specifics instead of uh, just drafting an entire bill because of the reasons that I've said, which can be summarized into two. You waste time and you won't get marks for it. So that's my take. How about okay, uh, thanks. Well, uh... I would uh, agree with your submissions. You see, sometimes you have to look at uh, the marks given. Last year, when we were doing LWD, our question was fixed. It is 20 marks. So it only makes sense that you draft an entire bill. So when you see this question here, the clauses are actually broken down into, into four parts. So the examiner wants you to do exactly that, okay? Because at the end of the day, you have three hours in every CLE exam. The three hours uh, themselves are quite short. I won't lie to you. If uh, we took around one hour, 30 minutes drafting an entire bill last year, and you have four questions and done, you have four questions and done because you, at the end of the day, you have to attempt five questions. Question one is compulsory. So you have four questions that are undone, and you have one hour, um, 30 minutes left. And remember, these four questions are all drafting. OK, so it is advisable for you to try and use the shortest time possible. That's why so long I started by saying, you know, um, practice itself makes perfect. Take this to any bank and cash it. If you know how to draft, you can take the shortest time possible to do that particular drafting. Forget the theory, get the drafting, get the art of drafting. You can take the shortest time possible, spend most of the time on these other questions, perfect on them, and then come back to even go through your paper. Okay, but if you don't know how to draft, well, you have no business, you know, sitting for that particular exams, because I won't lie to you. At least 60% of CL exams drafting. The only paper that doesn't have drafting perhaps could be trial, but either way, uh, trial sometimes has little um, um, uh, aspects of drafting, but not that much. So maybe that's the only paper that you would you would find easier, you know, uh, to evade drafting. But professional ethics, from professional ethics all the way upwards, you have drafting. So if you've if you've not mastered, you know, how to draft, start now. So in this particular question, just answer the question as uh, each has been broken down for parts and uh yeah so to save on time and also save on cost because time is money i think you answered uh the person who asked the question asked yeah yeah thank you okay. great so um we are done and no other concerns that we haven't addressed is there any that you haven't addressed to just remind me i got logged off um so perhaps if you ask me a question and I didn't respond, you can just shoot it up. So that part of the question now, uh, Solonka, or where are we? Solonka. Uh, sorry, Lavin, sorry. My network was a bit shaky. Uh, please. No worries. So we are... Uh, is part, part of the question? Yes. Part, part of the question? Yeah, you're in oh, that so part are. of the say I hadn't begun with that. Yes, yes. Awesome. Um, substantive sections. So substantive sections are touching only on the enforcement part of the bill. Again, get the question right. You know, the trap here is this part, enforcement part. Don't try all those other provisions or, you know, um, facts that are unnecessary. Because last week we told you every sentence has a meaning. Every word has a meaning. 
and there's a trap there. So if you don't see the trap, that's up to you. So the question specifically asks the enforcement part of the bill. So what are the substantive sections that will touch on this particular part? Any trial? We have Otieno. Uh, please, uh, you can unmute and speak. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Lavins. I was thinking uh, to mentioning the definition or the interpretation, interpretation bit of it, but since you've mentioned that it's uh, the question says touching only on the enforcement part of the bill. Uh, I'd start by uh, the object of the act as a substantive uh, section. Section. Uh, Lovings, hope I was heard. Yes, I heard you. Uh, thank you. So perhaps before we go to uh, other trials, what you have to understand when it comes to a bill, eh? we have what we call the principal provisions. Okay, so under the principal provisions, you have the substantive provisions, and then you have the administrative provisions. So maybe next time, CLE will tell you, you know, to stay to draft the key administrative provisions of this particular bill. But since you only focus on the substantive, well, you lose your H marks, not because you don't know, but because you think it was necessary for you to read on that particular aspect, okay? So now here, they want the substantive provisions. And um, that's where we are. Because in a nutshell, eh, the bill has preliminary provisions. It has um, the principal provisions. It has the miscellaneous provisions. And it has the final provisions. So all these four parts of any bill, you should know what exactly is contained in those particular provisions. I've just told you the principal provisions contain the substantive provisions and they contain the administrative provisions. The preliminary provisions contain what we call arrangement of sections or clauses. You have the long title, you have the preamble, you have the enacting formula, you have the short title, you also have the commencement date, you have the interpretation provisions, and last but not least, you have uh, application. The principal provisions, I've told you what they contain. So when you go to the miscellaneous provisions, here you have the miscellaneous and uh, supplementary provisions, which normally include what we call financial matters. We have offenses. We have power to make regulations. You have such, you know, uh, you know, a seizure and arrest, depending on the offense made and what have you. And then lastly, you have the final provisions. So under the final provisions, you have four things. Four key things. First one, you have the savings. Okay, savings clauses. Two, you have the trans transitional provisions. Okay, and there are some provisions that transit into this particular bill. Third, you have what you call the repeals and consequential amendments. And then lastly, you have the schedules. So those four things, please, at your own free time, get to dig deeper and understand what they're all about. So the trial by Ocheno Forrester World is uh, uh, is okay, but I need more. And you can just write those upsetting provisions on those facts. Okay, so any other person, perhaps with another trial? Because all these sections are just there. I mean, all this provision that I need are just on the facts of the case. So just go there and try to find out what exactly will constitute, you know, um, substantive uh, sections touching on uh, only. The key word there is only on the enforcement part of the bill. 
any other trial? Thank you, uh, Kuchen, for, for that. Uh, any other trial? Yes, uh, Kimani. Caroline. Um, well, before you had mentioned what the sections contain, uh, this is what I had written, and I, I am a bit sure about, okay, you'll just tell me. So I did section five, and section five is titled Functions of the Public Service Order Board. Um, the functions of the Kenya Public Service Order Board shall be two, and then there's a, I don't know what to call it, a hyphen, and then A, to investigate conduct that is injurious, I hope I pronounce it like, uh, right to public order, then a semicolon, then be to collaborate with relevant agencies to ensure public safety and well-being, then a semicolon, and C, to perform any other functions necessary for the attainment of the objectives of this act. So uh, um, be before you mentioned that the offenses are found in the miscellaneous provisions, I had drafted section 28 and I had titled it detain, detainment of persons. So I had written the offenses, but I think now as per your, uh, what you've said, I don't think that would fit among the substantive sections. So yeah, that's just what I think. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline, for that insightful attempt. Anyone else? Guys, you have the answer on this on those parts of the case. And your work has even been made easier. The reason why it's eight marks is because examiner knows you'll have to go back and refer to the facts of the case and then craft in your own way and words for you to come up with something as substantive as and convincing as possible. Any other attempt? I just want, you know, I mean, provisions on enforcement of this bill. Hey, people, trial. Yes, um, Otieno. Okay, I've just gone through the, 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 the question. Yes. Uh, and I'm saying this is uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, in the fifth, uh, the fifth uh, paragraph of the question, let me say it's where the the meat is. Eh? So um, there's this part which says, uh, what is it? Uh, the government realizes that they need to set up an institution which would be responsible for investigating conduct. So um, the key thing here is the institution. So. Uh, being a substantive provision, then uh, I feel it is important to establish the body, uh, and this body is this institution. So, like, um, uh, how do I put it? Uh, like uh, the establishment of uh, the public order institution. So that would be the 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 substantive provision. Then you go ahead, maybe uh, in the sections, then you provide for uh, maybe the uh, the function, the key functions of the of the institution. Uh, maybe the powers, uh, maybe uh, 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 how, how do I put? It? Maybe the, you can also provide for the officials uh, of those institutions how they uh, uh, they are uh, uh, elected into office. So such stuff. Uh, I think I'd, I'd I'd answer that. Well. Uh Fair enough. So um, if you want to answer it in such a manner, how would you answer part four? Thank you. I mean, you have a uh, um, great way of reasoning, but how will you answer part four? Because part four, you know, talks about establishing a relevant uh, body on C. So what will you do? Because I uh, will uh, perhaps make those strongest points that you've put across, check them to part four. Because the bill needs to be enforced. So what are the substantive sections? I've given you a breakdown of how the structure of a bill should be. And the four or five provisions I've mentioned, 
and what exactly you know it contains so it's up to you who can tell me i mean what are these what are these substantive sections touching only on the enforcement part of the bill In the trial, I'll still tell you people the answers are in that particular question. Honestly. Yes, um, Dulo Kandi. How are you? Fine, thank you. So awesome. before I before I make an attempt, I just uh, have a question. Yes. By enforcement, do we mean the sections that um, create offenses and the penalties for the seed offenses? Because um, that's what I have. Well, like, I wouldn't want to uh, give you exactly uh, the answer, but I would like you. And thank you, because at the end of the day, the reason why you're asking all these questions is because next time they don't escape your mind and you have the necessary knowledge to tackle perhaps similar question on a bill and what have you. I just want us to reason together because we are here to learn and uh, ask as many questions as you can on what constitutes exactly enforcement. So in your own words, what constitutes enforcement? Is it the offenses laid out in the miscellaneous provisions? And the other question should be, do miscellaneous provisions qualify to be substantive sections of any bill? You see, like we are asking questions at the same time we are trying to find answers on them. So what constitutes the enforcement part of a bill? Because that's where we are, uh, you know, we are we are caged by the examiner, and he or she has thrown away the keys so that we don't end up flying and perch on different trees, you know, or uh, the tallest buildings available. So we are within that cage. So let's reason within that cage. We shouldn't go out, and that cage is on the enforcement part of that specific, you know, bill itself. And you are only limited to only. The examiner should have even uh, put only in bold so that it guides you. You know exactly you are not supposed to go beyond here. Yeah, so keep those questions and concerns coming. But at the end of the day, I'm certain we'll find a solution out. Okay, um, before Deche, let me go to Ocheng, please unmute and talk. Yes, uh, um, thank you, Lavins. But uh, okay, I don't know how it would uh, it would actually be phrased, but it emanates from that sentence in the fifth paragraph. Yes, where it said that uh, there was also need to allow the state to detain persons in mm -hmm. situations where it was felt that there was a danger. There were a danger to society. So I think the detention part is the enforcement. Okay, interesting. Well, uh, keep them coming. Um, uh, I'm just smiling over here because you you, you are uh, you're questioning exactly what you know I needed to question. So yeah, our uh, Thanks, Oching. Thanks uh, for, uh, for your contribution. So yeah, uh, Deche. Hello, am I audible? You are. You are. You are. Proceed. Okay, um, I'll apologize because I don't know how to phrase it, but a substantive uh, provision would be one which creates uh, rights and duties on a person. And as such, I would like to think that the substantive provision will come from the sentence in paragraph five, which reads, uh, it, is, it was noted that Khalifa was extremely active on social media, 
while none of his communication on social media has blatantly spread uh, ha, was blatantly spreading violence the state was concerned that khalifa did not know the extent of his freedom of expression so here the uh, state would like to impose uh, duties uh, or limit the rights of khalifa with relation to uh, freedom of, of expression so i would think this would be uh, relating to the substantive provision which barely talks about the rights and the privileges and duties imposed on a persons uh, to govern their conduct in doing certain things perfect fantastic um, um that's it you 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 have you have you know, people, uh, one thing I need you to understand is the examiner knows, you know, you, you, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll maybe find challenges or you will, uh, you will turn to sort of uh, perhaps overthink. You get it? But once you know how a bill is structured in those four aspects, as I had mentioned, and I will still repeat, you have the preliminary provisions. You have the principal provisions. You have the miscellaneous provisions. And lastly, you have the final provisions. So all these provisions, they have sub, they have, uh, sorry, they have sub provisions. And if you don't, if you don't know what those sub provisions are, it will be hard for you to answer this particular question. Because under miscellaneous provisions, it has those offenses, you know, I mean, uh, all those things which I think most of your contribution try to uh, perhaps mention while well, good trial. But all these provisions, you know, they have different things. For me, I'm concerned so much about the principal provisions, the substantive provisions. How should this particular bill enforced or implemented? I don't know, could be the language of the examiner, but whatever the case, the answer lies in those facts, and 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 you'd see that um, he doesn't even want you to stream. He or she knows ah, uh, you've seen the word only, you've seen the word substantive, you've you've seen the word enforcement. Go back to the facts. What will constitute substantive sections? What will constitute how, why, when enforcement should be made? Okay, because if you did establish that particular relevant body, then there's no need for you to answer question four, because that will become a cake uh, repetitive, and uh, I shouldn't say obscene, but it's 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 a uh, the examiner might perhaps just uh, ignore what you mentioned in part four because you mentioned it already in part three. So before I proceed, um, I'd like to welcome. Radhika before I welcome Kelvin and I'd like all of you I mean to contribute tell me exactly what you feel I mean you have this question just contribute um we are we are here to learn and we are here to ensure that all of us get the right thing in the right manner and with the right people to guide you so yeah Radhika please do unmute and uh speak Thank uh, you. contribute to this Thank you. So um, I heard what one of the previous speakers had talked about um, having a provision to arrest those who are encouraging some sort of uh, violence. Yes. So I attempted to do so. So I just called it Section 20 and I titled it Arrest of Persons Encouraging Unrest Through Social Media. Mm -hmm. And um, then I, I just drafted this in the last two minutes, so apologies. But I said the, the, pu the public order board will have the discretion and power to arrest persons who a post any messages, post any public messages on social media that could be interpreted to encourage physical violence or encourage acts classed as a danger to society, semicolon, b post or share images or videos that could be interpreted to encourage physical violence or acts that would be classed as a danger to society. Interesting. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, uh, for those uh, comments. I, I do appreciate. Um, Calvin, Calvin. 
I don't know if there's any other person whose hands is, uh, is raised. Hello. I can hear you. Hello. I can hear you. Um, so uh, my approach was uh, to draft a provi uh, not a provision, uh, a section on inspectors, so yes. that uh, I, the first part says the agency shall, for the purposes of enforcing these provisions of this act, appoint such number of inspectors as appropriate. I also uh, put another sub, uh, clause saying a person appointed as inspector shall have full police powers. Then I said that the board may designate other public officers as inspectors. Then I just drafted two provisions on the powers of inspectors. And then maybe the second section I would have drafted was now uh, offenses considered to be against the public order. Well, um, great. And uh, remember my, my, my question? Uh, I don't know, I mean, how scholarly this uh, might get, but uh, I asked a question. Could miscellaneous provisions be construed to mean they also constitute um, the substantive aspect of the bill? I asked that particular question for a reason. Because I've seen offenses, uh, or aspects of offenses on the enforcement part of the bill. I don't know, maybe perhaps at your own convenience, at your own time, try and research if the miscellaneous provisions of the bill, which normally constitutes, you know, um, offenses, will form part of the substantive aspect of, 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 of a bill. And that one will mean, if it does form the substantive aspect of this particular bill, it will mean one thing, that, well, it is a principal provision. And if it is a principal provision, then what's the need of having a miscellaneous provision? I don't know if you guys understand what I'm trying to talk about. You know, it's it's a whole, you know, scholarly setup of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, Q&A. We ask questions to find answers, okay? So, um, well, uh, Calvin, you have something to say? Yeah, uh, yes. so I was thinking, since yes. the bill we are drafting is a criminal bill, as mentioned in the question, and it's similar to the penal code, yes. you know, the essence is to create offenses. It, they can't be miscellaneous provisions. Sorry, I can't hear you. I would assume the essence of a criminal justice or uh, a bill for criminal offenses is to set out the offenses, meaning that placing them offenses in the miscellaneous provisions would be uh, contrary to the primary objective of the bill. Well, uh, interesting. Um, uh, that's a good angle of looking at it. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, yeah, that one could, uh, could be um, quite a solid base to argue your point on. Yeah, so thanks. Um, any other person, perhaps, with uh, anything to contribute towards? Hey, people, talk. I mean, uh, you have you have the facts there. Just try to, to come up, you know, with uh, with something. But in essence, what I'm trying to talk about. I mean, for you to answer part three of this particular question. What is enforcement? Perhaps that's where we should begin from. What is enforcement? Enforcement, in my own words, because I don't want to refer to dictionary, enforcement could mean how do you make, you know, uh, the objects of this particular bill come to life. By this, we will mean how do you who are the right persons? Okay, what's the right channel? What's the means? I don't want to use the same word to explain the same way. So what's, what is the means of executing that particular mandate? And on whose shoulders are these responsibilities resting? And if there is a gap or disconnect, 
in the functions of the you know um persons responsible to execute this bill what happens that's my simple way of uh, trying to break down for three and if i could answer those particular questions it will be easier for me i'll go back to those facts try and find out are there persons responsible here should i you know perhaps not even impose just you know, um, um, apportion some you know, responsibilities on them. And the timeline of enforcing, you know, all these responsibilities to ensure that the act itself, you know, um, comes to life within that particular timeline that you've given. And what happens if there's a disconnect between the functions of the persons responsible to, uh, to execute this bill. I'm trying to avoid the word in force. You see, in an exams, you don't even need to cram. You need to have your time. I mean, try and just play around with these words, break them down in your own way. OK, and it will be easier for you to answer those questions. And you'll take around two to three minutes, to drop those sections here. And you're good to go. But my assignment for you Go and uh, find out, uh, notwithstanding um, Calvin's insightful opinion on uh, needless of having a miscellaneous provision on a quote unquote criminal bill. Uh, I think that went quite comic, but uh, I'm trying to avoid calling it a criminal bill. But if a miscellaneous provision could, uh, is as good as not being there, on any bill affecting the uh, perhaps uh, criminal aspect in any society. That's an assignment. You go do your own reading, go do your own research, and ask yourself whether it, it could still constitute the substantive provision of any bill. And when you have the answer, well, you can easily answer the uh, that third part of the question. So without much. I could say part four because sometimes bills, not sometimes, bills are always classified into you have part one, you know, preliminary provisions, part two, blah, blah, part three, like that, but until part five or six there. So let's say part three or part four establishes this particular body. So what are the clauses or sections? It's as simple as that. So what sections will come there? Any terms? You guys gave me the answers already. Me, I just want you to just um, repeat, but now in clarity, okay? So what sections will come under that part establishing this particular body? Any hands up? Yes, uh, Kimani. Um, I think there would be a section uh, um, establishing the public order board or the public service order board, depending on what one chooses. And then there would be a, a section on the composition of the board where you list uh, who the, the, the chairperson, the principal secretaries, and the director at the very end. Um, I, 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 I don't think we would include the, sec, the functions section i think it would fit more in part three uh, in the former question question three question one three
okay um kimani well uh pops just just to confirm one thing i've have you guys um been taught on bills are you yet there sorry did you ask whether we've been taught how to draft bills yes yes um yeah we've had like two classes on bills um yes. but- we are we are not yet done. We are we are we are we are in the process of finishing, or rather, we're in the process of drafting. But we haven't been fully taught about what bills entail, fully. Ah, I see. Uh, maybe perhaps um, that's why you have uh, difficulty in. Uh, I understand, but um, I promise you, uh, when uh, when uh, we will still revisit bills because I. I maybe perhaps you know um, speak you know things that maybe you guys may find out later, perhaps in three to four weeks, and may seem quite challenging right now. So you will just allow me, eh? and uh, this is a promise. So remind me, we will still go over um, bills because I can see there are a number of concerns um, on the same. I hope uh, that's okay. I will uh, reverse it. Bills again. So I hope that's in order. Okay. Yes, Deche. Yeah, uh, I wanted to suggest that since not all the classes have been able to tackle this part, for those of us who have been able to have a class or two, we can be able to mug up something in terms of trying to draft the various provisions since we know a little as to what they entail. And then we yes. can just forward it to you and you be able to correct us on wherever we are going wrong as we wait for the others to learn so that we can come and revisit together. Fantastic idea. So, um... That one, that one is in order. Well, uh, I will, my team and I will, uh, will go through the same, uh, through those drafts and uh, get back. But uh, I promise we will uh, reverse it. So it's all for the sake of time because I really want to spend so much time on question one, uh, given that most of you haven't been taught on uh, bills. But I will because you never know what CLA may bring. They may just bring bills. They don't care. Okay. So it's it's up to you, but uh, yeah. So you send me those drafts. I will uh, forward it to my team, and then we will uh, we will uh, work on it. So I think we should now go to question two, and then um, try and uh, save much time on this. So just someone to read question two quickly. Question two, a group of residents from Mirango Ne Estate approached you for assistance. The chairman of Mirango Ne Estate who spoke on behalf of the group noted that uh, they had a complaint against the national, uh, the Nairobi County, sorry. For almost three years, the county has used a lot of adjustment to their estate as a, a dumping site. The county did not consult the people of Mlango ne estate on the decision to have a dumping site there. Recently, a not for um, a not for profit organization called Doctors for Health sent a team of medical specialists to, to assess uh, the impact of the dumping site. On the people of uh, Mirangone Estate, uh, the specialists found uh, the dumping site had negatively affected the children. Uh, some children had developed breathing problems as a result of smoke from the dump, uh, from the burning rubbish at the dump uh, dump site. Other children had skin condition that the doctors noted may be traced to population uh, pollution caused by the dump site. Furthermore, the residents 
of Milangoine Estate complained that the value uh, of their houses went, uh, went down soon after the county decided to create a dump site near the estate. Uh, the National Environment. Uh, uh, Solonga, can you scroll up? Strong. Scroll. Solonga, please uh, scroll. Yeah, yeah great. Uh, thanks. Uh -huh. Proceed. Who was reading? Okay, thank you. Then the National Environment Management Authority has used a statement that uh, the county never sought its permission to set up the dump site and that an environment impact assessment was never done in respect of the dump site. After discussion with the group, you have agreed to visit uh, Milangone Estate on, uh, on a later date to speak to all families affected and agree on steps for legal redress. A, prepare a letter to Mirango in the estate, a resident detailing the legal issues arising out of these facts and possible ways of redressing them. B, prepare a letter of demand to Nairobi County on behalf of the, uh, the residents of Mirango in the estate. Fantastic, Thank thanks. Thank you. You see, these are free 10 marks. You have a letter, you, um, Again, the keywords there are two. You have to detail the legal issues arising out of these facts. And the other um, question is on redressing them. So you have a problem and you have a solution. Well, I would assume, not even assume, you know how to draft a formal letter, okay? And, um, The other thing that you need to note is you have to identify, you know, I mean, the legal issues that do arise here. So what are the legal issues? Because they're just on the facts. Just give me those legal issues. You have pollution. I mean, that's that's it. But what are other, you know, um, legal issues well i can see um lack of public participation amazing great the other legal issue there's a medical condition can you see that Can you see that? You are breathing problems as well, affecting those children. Are you seeing a problem on access to information? Depreciation of value of the houses. Can you see that? It's here, access to lack of access to information. What's the other problem? Depreciation of value of their houses. Thank you. Just just right after after the health conditions. Thanks. Um, I think those are five already. So you have five legal issues identified quickly. Of the solution. Um, Lavins, can I add one more issue? Who is that speaking? It's Marcy. Yes, yes. Uh, 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 proceed. Okay. My other issue is that um, failure of the county to actually seek permission from the National Environment National Environmental Management Authority to set up a dumping site. Then I think it's also another issue. Thank you, uh, Candy. Um, related to what the previous speaker mentioned, that um, yes. an environmental impact assessment was never done. So that is an issue. And of course, it relates to issuance of an EIA license by NEMA. So there was no EIA license that authorized the county government 
to establish the dumping site. Thank you. Fantastic. Yas Radhika, please. Uh, I feel like mine is a bit far-fetched, but I also got flashbacks of tort law in terms of Rylands and Fletcher because you see things escaping from the other land. But I, I, I have a feeling it's a bit too far. Why? That could be a point. Yeah. Don't sell yourself short. I mean, yes. you, 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 you have a point. So it's up to you to now find the right ones and fix it. In. But uh, that's a good point, regardless. All right. So we start with the first uh, legal issue on uh, uh, the um, EIA licenses, Environmental Impact Assessment um, licenses, um, not being there and permission not being sought from NEMA, okay, to set up that dumping site. How would you redress this? How would you address and redress? Hey, people, this is something that you see. I mean, this is a public interest litigation. I mean, how would you address this? It's easier. I mean, you have a county that sets up a dumping site without authority from NEMA. What do you do? Petition. Tell me. I mean, don't doubt yourself. I mean, it's that easier. I mean, tell me. I mean, what do you do? What would you do? Was speaking. Someone was speaking. I mean, uh, where has she gone to? But how would you address that particular legal issue? Yes, Daniel. Uh, hi, Lavin. Oh, yeah. uh, I, uh, I believe that this issue is about uh, Article 42 of the Constitution. Article and, what? Uh, which 42 of the Constitution. Uh -huh, proceed. On environment. And mm -hmm. so I believe Article 162.2 would come into force and the right court to approach in this instance would be the environment and lands court so you draft a constitutional petition to that court fantastic 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 yes mm -hmm. but there's also some two other provisions of the constitution that will perhaps give weight to that you know provision that you've mentioned which are these just two okay um i'm thinking uh first of all on uh local standi we have Article 22. Then on uh, what you what you can be asking for, it's in Article 23. Uh, but again, I'm thinking just to couple this with some more. If you also look at Article 43 on the right to health and uh, proper sanitation, I think that could also be an addition to you know this That's petition. It. Thank you, thank you. Um, man, you are uh, you are right for the exams. Thanks. I mean, those are the provisions that you should never forget in any any um constitutional petition and what is the locus classicus of the case that uh, puts down what should be considered by a court before it determines whether this is a constitutional petition or not what's that locus classicus what's that case well i once sent you a list of cases and that case is there what's that case no people don't tell me you've forgotten there is a locus classicus of constitutional petition. <laughs> Don't tell me you forgot it. What is the locus classicus of constitutional petition? Oh my God. Uh, Vince, yes. Maybe you can see our hands. Uh, I believe. <laughs> oh, yeah. on um, local, we're speaking. On Daniel, Daniel Odor, I just. Spoke. Yes, yes, Daniel, I'll proceed. Yeah, I believe it's the Mumo Matemo versus Trusted Society of Human Rights. Um, well, that's one of them, but not the Locus Classicus. Mm -mm. But but good trial, good trial. 
Anyone? Um, there is Nyansa Roda. Lovins. Anarita Kiremi versus. Ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Anarita Kiremi is it. Oh my God. Don't ever forget that case. That's the locus classicus of constitutional petition. Well, you can't put in there Mumu Matemu. Yeah. So when an examiner sees, you know, those things, why would he or she deny you marks? Yes, Daniel. Lavin, um, I don't know. Maybe this is a bit uh, out of question. Yes. Uh, but in your own thinking and considering Article 159 2D, yes. do you think we should still be talking about an Arita Karimi case? <laughs> I believe it focuses more on form to the extent that it doesn't care about justice. Yes, I believe that it is a uh, undue regard to procedure. It's my belief we should, that we shouldn't be talking about it, in my opinion. Well, um, now now you've opened a uh, Pandora box on a uh, uh, scholarly debate, and I would uh, ask you to look for me after this. Perhaps you will engage more for the sake of time. But good point. I mean, uh, right. yeah, I right. I like the way you are trying to evoke, you know, questions and emotions on this. So yeah, thank you. Um, just you can uh, say to talk to me. We could engage on that. All right. Thank you. So, what is the other legal issue? Um, yes, Asta. Um, hi, Pielo. Um, hi. I, think for, I wanted I, I wanted to ask a question, probably in relation before before we go to the next issue. Yes. Um, for myself, I would have actually said that we go first to the um, the tribunal established under MCA before going yes. to court. So I yes. don't know if that would be acceptable. Well, it is acceptable and at the same time it's not acceptable. Well, you see um, the courts of equal status. I mean, you have the ELC, you have the ELRC. Um, sometimes a person is allowed to bypass all these, you know, um, should I say, uh, mechanisms for, for, for um, resolution of disputes and go directly to the high court. In this case, ELC has the same powers as the high court, the courts of equal status. OK, so it all depends perhaps with the urgency of your matter, because by the time the tribunal decides on your on your issue and there is continuous damage on the other side, then that wouldn't be appropriate. So I will just advise you go directly to um, to uh, the court of uh, equal status, ELC, but depends because I think there was in our project work, civil litigation, there was such such a conflict, you know, should you go to net or should you go to ELC? Well, it all depends how you argue a case, but I will still insist you you choose the right forum based on the urgency of your water. I hope that's okay, Esther. Um, yes, that's clear. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, one boy, come on. Oh, hi, uh, Pielo, I, uh, a quick one. Um, I don't know, maybe perhaps I got a bit lost um, in the yes. discussion. Um, the question, prepare a letter to, because I've had um, the, the discussion going um, along the lines of a constitutional petition. So I was yes. wondering, is that the format that now question A is supposed to take? Like, are you supposed to be drafting a petition that now has, is, is is addressing these legal issues or are you supposed to just draft a normal letter or how are you supposed to know like because i think initially i thought you're just supposed to like do a normal letter but then now you highlight the legal issues in the letter but then i don't know now because I've, I've seen <laughs> i so please just clarify well well um, um uh, thank you uh, for your for your concern well you will only draft a normal letter so now in the substance or body of your life, mention a constitutional petition as a means of redress. I hope that's okay. Ah, okay, so the format is an, is the letter, but then the constitutional yeah, petition. Yeah. Ah, okay, all right. Then yes. That's, yeah, that's yes. Okay. Okay. Just a letter, just a letter. But on the issues that you've identified, now on the redress, you say a constitutional petition. You understand? 
Yes, one more. Do you yes, understand? Yes, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Thank you. Awesome. Yes, uh, Muturi, one boy. Before I uh, get back to you, Daniel. Yes, a follow-up question, and what uh, the, the, the speaker, the, the previous speaker, have inquired. Um, yes. is, the, is this letter supposed to take the format of a legal opinion, and uh, is it a, is this supposed to be a letter that uh, has a a, a letter head or something? Or how is it is this supposed to the format of the letter? Well, well, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, that, that's a, a concern that that's been uh, eating up most students. Whether you should have a letterhead, but you don't have time to create a letterhead on your on your letter. You have three hours to work against. So I'd uh, I'd say just incorporate um, the essentials of uh, uh, of uh, of of a formal letter. Okay, and um, yeah. It will take a form of a legal opinion because at the end of the day, you have to identify issues, you know, and uh, um, facts. You have to analyze that specific, you know, problem that you've identified and how do you redress, you know, that particular problem. So, yeah, that's it. I hope that's okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, because there was such a similar thing last year during our paper. Yeah, I mean, uh, like Solonka said, it was just drafting. You get tired, but you still continue drafting. But yeah, so that's the essence of LWD. And uh, yeah, you keep practicing. Okay, so Daniel, uh, please uh, uh, proceed. Okay, well, uh, I was just thinking, considering the urgency of this matter apart from talking about the constitutional petition don't you think it would also be proper to talk about conservatory orders so that we are able to protect these people as fast as possible or so that these guys are able to remove those things from that place as fast as possible or that would be a bit too much not too much that's exactly what i said and uh, uh, when i was uh, answering uh, esther as uh, i told her the urgency of the matter really matters Okay, so yeah, you go seek file, you know, uh, a CAU, uh, you know, before the ELC, got the conservatory orders, and yeah, try to uh, sort of disrupt the status quo. Yeah, that's in order. It's not too much. All right. Okay. So yeah, any other issue, Fox? Uh, what is the other issue that we identified here? Public participation or something? Yes. How do you redress public participation? Lack of public participation. And um, yes. First of all, what article of the Constitution governs public participation? Because there are provisions in the Constitution that by now you should have at the tip of your fingers. So what is the provision on public participation in our category? Which article? Yes, Deche. Uh, first and foremost is Article Ten. Yes. Yeah. Beyond that, uh, there is Article One Eighteen and One Nineteen, but those ones relate relate to uh, formation of a bill. When you uh, when there is a bill to be passed and all that, then there should be public participation. But specifically in this question, I wouldn't have employed uh, Article 10. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, so that's it. So how do you redress lack of public participation? How would you redress that? It's simple. I mean, uh, the same procedure. I mean, how would you do that? Lack of public participation. Willing to approach the court to quash uh, the same? Hey, people. What will you do? I mean, how would you uh, redress that? Yes, Daniel. Uh, I believe, uh, uh, Lavin, that yes. this just revolves around the same issue, and we will yes. use a constitutional petition. Yes. 
Yes, uh, but now this matter, I think it doesn't talk about the courts under Article 162.2. Yes. So we'll approach the High Court. Perfect. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because uh, why the High Court? Perhaps just to clarify on, uh, or, uh, or to the rest of the students, why would you approach the High Court and not the ELC? Regardless, them being cause of equal status. Because there's always a provision that sets them apart. And there's a reason why the judges of the ELC will never at any given time sit in the High Court. So why would you approach the High Court, not the ELC? Daniel? Uh, Lavins, I think for me it's an issue of uh, jurisdiction. And if you yes. look at Article 162.2, it's yes. very clear on what uh, these courts should do, the courts and uh, I mean this ELRC and the other ones. Their purview is well stated there. So even though they have equal status, when it comes to jurisdiction, that is something else. It's not about status. So if you look at uh, 165 on, you know, the powers of the high court, you'll find that issues as to this, you know, uh, issues as to interpretation and administration in relation to powers that come from the constitution, it's proper that you approach the High Court and not the ELC because it's not an issue that falls under their, you know, their purview. Their power is, their power is to deal with special issues concerning, you know, employment and land and all that. Fantastic, fantastic. So people, I mean, I hope you are getting the reasons that we are mentioning here. Even though the first part we approach the ELC and the second part of public participation, we will it approach the ELC. It's very, very important. Okay, so try and uh, get the uh, distinction between the high court, the normal high court, and the courts of equal status. Okay, what is the other legal issue that we identified? Yes, Mbidi, Calvin. Uh, I just wanted to raise two concepts. Uh, yes. The first one is uh, this pollution is a criminal offense. Yes. So maybe discuss about how uh, this matter is supposed to yes. be. Also, the, the people uh, doing this uh, pollution should also be held criminally liable. And then the second issue would be this concept of lead agencies. Uh, when NEMA handles anything environmentally related, it's supposed yes. to coordinate with what are called lead agencies. These are any agency that has a role to play in environment management. So for example, you'd have the county. Uh, the other example would be maybe the water resource management, maybe Kenya urban roads. So uh, you just try to identify how many, but the idea is uh, my first port of call would be to identify how the environmental authority, management authority NEMA can yes. provide some remedies in terms of referring the matter to the DCI ordering the lead agency, the county, because they have that power to, to stop that particular pollution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, man. I, I'm, I'm very much impressed by, you know, how far you guys are reading, because uh, there are things that may not really be taught in class, like exactly what you've, you know, told me, or you've mentioned the rest of the students, Calvin, but to that extra step, that extra step of finding out more, beyond the four walls of the classroom or beyond the screens in our, you know, Microsoft Teams class. That's what sets you apart from the rest. And that's what makes you achieve that nine P's. OK, so yeah, I'm very much impressed. Thank you. Um, hey, uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, with regards to the fact that we are approaching High Court rather than ELC. Yes. Uh, in my thinking, I, I was I was like, instead of using Article 162, wouldn't mm. it be proper if I use Article 258, which gives uh, one a right to approach the court for a violation of uh, uh, the Constitution that is beyond beyond the rights and fundamental freedoms? You have uh, you you can approach the court for a violation of the any other provision of the Constitution, and more so. I align this with Article 165, particularly 165.3D, uh, 
paragraph two allows mm. uh, the high court to interpret the constitution in uh, whereby the question is uh, one is claiming that the constitution has been violated rather than using a negative approach as to why it is not ELC. I use a, a positive approach as to why it's the high court by virtue of the provisions which are straightforward giving the jurisdiction to the high court. Amazing uh, insights. And uh, see, at the end of the day, you, you'll get marks, both of you, because what the examiner wants to see is why did you choose the high court and not the ELC? That's it. So those provisions that you've mentioned, they do really, you know, accentuate and uh, perhaps give to life that particular reason that we've mentioned. And uh, again, it's uh, impressive. So again, is, you should make the constitution your, your best friend right now because the provisions in that particular book that you at all times should have at your finger, uh, fingertips. Because when CLE mentions Article 164 and you don't know what Article 164 is all about, you can't even confirm because you don't have your phone in there, you have nothing. So get to read, especially on matters, the hierarchical structure of codes. Do read that stuff. Thank you, Deci. Um, Daniel? Uh, Lavin, uh, I was just yes. wondering. Uh, if we are, we look at this question in its entirety, like if we look at it wholesomely, uh, don't you think that maybe just just one constitution, constitutional petition will be able to deal with this matter, you know, to its end? And I feel like the substantial part of our question deals with environmental issues. So I think, however much we have so many issues, which you know might go to different courts, if we look at them separately. Don't you think it would be proper for us to just approach the ELC because most of these issues around, you know, environment, environmental matters and leave the high court out of it. So in our constitutional petition, we just write those issues that we know very well are related to environment. And at the end of the day, get orders that are able to deal with this question, you know, than having a petition in the high court, another petition in the ELC. I mean, that will take time in my, in my, in my, in my, my opinion. So I'm thinking that what if we just look at the issues that surround, that surround environment and just say that we'll go to the ELRC and get conservatory orders and deal with this issue, you know, as one than, you know, separating them. What do you think? Well, great. Uh, um, uh, people, uh, I, 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 we are, uh, we are trying, we are diving deeper each and every second into, um, scholarly debate and it's interesting well uh you know people are having different views on the same and uh you see at the end of the day what the examiner wants is for you to at least find one reason or one area of redress so it could be a consolidated you know um issues filed before the elc or the high court, depending on how you argue your case. But at the end of the day, those issues have to come alive on your on your answers. So different issues may have different triggers. So I think that's exactly what um, will suffice here. But if it were a real, you know, a case scenario, I will go with what you're saying, um, Daniel. I don't know if you're getting the discrepancy between what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so um, what is the other issue? I think the last one before we move to part uh, B. What is the other legal issue? Um, what is the other legal issue that we identified? I'm trying to recall. Uh, uh, Oh yeah, there is the issue of uh, value of houses. Someone, someone mentioned that to something, saying that. Um, yes, 
whoever raised that particular point, I mean, how would you address that? I can't recall who raised that point. Um, yes. That is, I'm the one who actually raised the point. On Sorry, the what's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wanyama, yes, proceed. Yeah, I'm the one who raised that point, and I, I my thought process was kind of similar to the previous speaker in that all these issues are arising from the same thing, which can equally be solved by a constitutional petition. So when I was raising this issue, it was a fact for consideration, or rather a proof that, that whatever these people are doing really, really um, caused harm to the residents. So on, on the redress, it will still go to the to the methods we've talked about, which is actually a constitutional petition, then conservatory orders, then the decisions will be quashed. But um, as much as you're talking about constitutional petition, when you are drafting constitutional petition some time back, we say that you can equally talk about issues of um, damages. So maybe that, that could be the, the little inclusive part in the release being sought damages for the loss experience or the foreseen loss. All right, thanks. So part B, I think what we will do is to just mention what constitutes a demand letter. Because I believe by now, you know how a demand letter should look like. So what constitutes a demand letter? Just quickly, because uh, we're just brushing through. One. Or I should start while well, you have authority. Uh, two. What constitutes a demand letter? Quickly, I mean, uh, we're just brushing up. Hey, people, what constitutes a demand letter? You know these things. I mean, what constitutes a demand letter? The demand itself. Sorry? The fact. Otieno? Yep. Yes. What constitutes a demand letter aside from authority to act? Uh, the fact then followed by the cause of action arising from the fact. Thank you. Another person? Quickly. Another person? Salutation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. uh, any other thing? Legal basis. Letterhead. The uh -uh. demand wait, itself. Wait, wait. Uh -huh. Yes, demand itself, legal basis. Uh -huh. The demand the itself of with compliance. The, yes, with Do you have a penal decision. note on a demand letter? Yes or no? No, we have the period no. of compliance. Sorry? And the, consequence of of non, the consequences of non compliance. Why don't we have a penal note on a demand letter? Again, this is something you should know at our, our locus class question the same. Why? Uh, why is it that at no given time will you ever, as an advocate, impose a criminal liability on any de uh, demand letter to a uh, uh, adverse party? What's the reason? I don't know if this question was asked during orals, but what's the reason? Because there is a case in civil litigation on this, on the same, I've forgotten. Is it Austin's versus Maurice or something? I don't know, there is there's such a case. I've even given you the answer, lol. <laughs> okay, uh -huh. why is it that you can never impose a criminal liability on a demand letter to an adverse party? Hey, people. Uh, Lavins, if I may try? Yes. Because a demand letter pertains to civil proceedings, hence you cannot curb both uh, civil and uh, civil proceedings in, in one action. They Perfect. arise differently. Perfect. I think it's the case of Austin versus Morris. Or, oh my goodness. Can I remember? Um, it should be that way. Yeah. Just look at the first term of your civil litigation. Miss Mongari went through that. It's there. Me, I'm certain it's there. I'll confirm and get back. Yes, so thank you. What other thing constitutes a demand letter? 
we've mentioned oil, uh, have we? Not oil. Yeah, the the things that are still locking. I mean, I can't see your faces. Who is that talking? Yeah, please. Uh, maybe you ask for uh, liability to be admitted. The demand letter. Yes, thank you. Uh -huh. mm, what else? And I also said to you guys. For delay. And yes, thank you. You guys, um, I sent you. Thank you, uh, Winfred. Yeah, there is an article I sent you by Feroz Neroji on the art of drafting a demand letter. Please go through that particular article. I sent it all those groups. When you read that article, you are home and dry when it comes to demand letter. It was an article by Feroz Neroji, senior counsel. Find that article. If you fail to find it, let me know. Just a DM me. Okay, so um, yes, Marcy. Um, you are also supposed to indicate um the specific time that you'd want that person to comply. Is it seven days, or is it ten days? Yeah, and uh, uh, I think the timeline always uh a differ. I don't know. I mean, right now. Uh, in practice, is it 14 days, 17 days, if someone is in town or something? I don't know, there is, there's something like that. Um, but whichever the case, the timeline does matter. Yeah, thank you. So I think we have exhausted on uh, on that. So if you if if you have those, you know, things on your fingertips, then th this question will be easier for you to answer. Okay, question three quickly. So Lonka, I'll just try to scroll upwards. Yes, someone to read it uh, quickly. Um, if I may, so clear and effective legislation is essential to good governance. It is also a critical point of the democratic process. It gives effect to policy, translating abstract principles and very specific provisions into legal remedies while mediate between the often conflicting objectives, views, and expectations of legislators and user. So these are quote from the Office of the Parliamentary Council UK. When laws become too complex, a review into the causes of complex legislation. March so 20. Sorry? Mm -hmm. No, 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 I'll proceed. Okay, so critically discuss the statement above in the context of benefits of plain language drafting. Uh, easier. I mean, you guys, benefits of uh, plain uh, language drafting? I will begin to give uh, the public an easier understanding of the documents upon peer perusal. What is the, what's the other benefit? Hey. It avoids verbosity in the documents that the citizens will read. Uh huh. Any other person? Uh, Lavins. Yes. Uh, it promotes gender neutrality in language. Perfect. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, plain the English is bad. Okay. Yes. Otieno. Uh, it inspires confidence in both uh, the reader and the writer. Perfect. And then I would also add that uh, one of the benefits of plain language drafting is to uh, reduce, minimize, or do away with the cost of correcting errors occasioned by verbosity and legalese. Okay. Great. We are done. Four marks. You have them. Part B. Someone else to read? Quickly, anyone? Anyone, Order anyone, two, just... Order wait, two wait, rule wait. 11. Yes, order two rule 11, admissions and denials. No, um, subject start, to, start, start with our spot, our spot. Yes. As part of its access to justice program, the International Commission for Jurists is preparing a simple version of civil procedure rules that can be used by individuals who want to represent themselves. They have requested you 
draft rules below using simple and plain English. Order 2 to 11, admissions and denials. Subject to sub rule 4, any allegation of fact made by a party in his pleading shall be deemed to be admitted by the opposite party unless it is traversed by that party in his pleadings or agenda of issues under rule 10 operate as a denial of it. Two, a traverse may be made either by denial or by a statement of non-admission and either expressly or by necessary implication. Three, subject to sub rule four, every allegation of fact made in plaint or counterclaim, which the party on whom it is served does not intend to admit shall be specifically traversed by him in his defense or defense to counterclaim. All, sorry, someone has muted me. Sorry, um, no. let me proceed. And a general denial of all such allegations, all a general statement on an admission of them shall not be sufficient a uh, traverse of them. Redraft this rule using ordinary and plain English. All right. So this is thank you. So this is where you suborn all your ancestors when it comes to using ordinary and plain English. One, we'll give it a try. You are you are redrafting, and by redrafting it means you have to observe the rule of uh, plain English and do away with legalese for the benefit of the layman or the public out there, as we've seen on the first part of this question in part A. So who will redraft this? Just a trial. Well, the facts are there. Just redraft that particular rule. Six bucks. What does the word traverse mean? Hey, people, what does the word traverse mean? That's where you should start. Once you know the meaning of that word, it's easy for you to drop the topic. Dine. Thank you. So now omit that word traverse, input, deny, and drop the entire thing. Is it necessary to use deemed? shall be deemed to clause one of that rule or uh yes no sub rule one of 11. no shall be deemed to is it legalese or is it plain english it is legalese so omit that one as well so i have given you all those cues and uh yeah it's easy for you to redraft that so who, who can who can uh, make a trial And then pleading, so agenda of issue, again, that one is uh, legalese. Again, omit that and replace. And some words are also repetitive there. Well, once you know the art of plain English, it's easier for you to redraft these things. Because why would you even say a traverse may be made either by denial? I mean, why? With that, it shouldn't be repetitive. So, once you understand that, then you drop the entire thing. Anyone quickly? Just a try. We are learning. So, the first one. What is the simplest word of pleadings? What is the simple English of pleadings? A layman wouldn't know what pleadings are. What would a layman know? Hey, people. Search documents. Sorry? If you tell a layman here, someone from a village all the way in uh, Takaungu, um, Taita Tavete, or uh, 
you know, the island of party in Lamu, they will not understand where the word plating is. What are the word do you think they will understand easier if you tell Document. them? Documents. Sorry? Documents. Documents. What do you say? Court, court you. Documents. Yes, do documents. Court documents, so fine. So anyone to just redraft this. Well, I have given you all those, you know, um, clues. We just redraft everything. Because I can see a plaint there. I can see also counterclaim. What other legalese could I see here? Uh, uh -huh. Yes, yes. I think those ones. Yeah. So anyone to redraft this quickly? We start with part one. Part one, yeah. Anyone to redraft part one? Because it's six marks. So I think it's two marks, two marks, two marks. So uh -huh. part one. Hey, people. Yes, Simu. Unmute, please. Hey, um, Simir, I can't hear you. Are you muted? Hey, or someone else to take over to try and redraft part uh, one. Hey, people. Yes, uh, uh, where I've seen where immaculate, please. Uh, just then use, but I also try just unmute where and then yeah, what? okay. So I'd split this sentence into two parts. Um, yes, but, please. But then I, I, I I in in my good judgment, I feel like maintaining the word leading, because yes. anyway, yes. Yeah, so I'll just maintain it. So subject uh -huh. to sub rule four, any allegation of fact made by a party in his pleadings shall be assumed to be admitted by the opposite party unless it is denied by that party. That will be the first part, and then um. Uh, issued agreed upon by parties under Rule 10 shall operate as a, a denial, then end there. Well, uh, fantastic trial. Uh, Yusuf Sherban, um, please. That's amazing, I'm wearing. Um, Yusuf? Um, I'd say subject to sub rule four, any allegation of uh, fact made by a party in the court documents shall be assumed to be admitted. Wait, we dropped off? Yeah. Oh, uh, proceed. So long as just keep uh, projecting. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, Shaban, you're muted. Uh, let me refer to the document, please. I'm so, look at, uh, could you please project? Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah so, sorry. There you go, Shaban. Uh, subject to sub rule four, any allegation of fact made by a party in the court document shall be assumed to be admitted by the opposite party unless denied in the unless denied or accumulation of issues under rule ten. 
will operate as a denial. Thank you. Um, what's what's the plain English for joint of issues? I replace no, no, the word English. joinder yeah. with accumulation. Right, I see what you did, but um, great. <laughs> Any other person? Any other person? Wait, what did we say the plain English for the word uh, shall be deemed to uh, is? What is our plain English for that? Supposed, I guess. Sorry? Supposed. Purposed or, or what? What did you say? S supposed. Oh, uh-huh. Okay. Presumed. <laughs> well, uh, deemed. I think it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, how can I put it? Is uh, oh this word um, the word deemed? Well, could be presumed or uh, yes, uh, that would still apply. So. Uh, uh huh. Well, what I would say, yeah, or if I were to redraft this, um, it's very complex, but um, I'd say this as a sub rule for states, okay, any allegation of fact made by a party in his certified court documents shall be presumed to be admitted by the opposite party unless it is denied by him or her. So there's no need for you to repeat the word party in the said certified court documents or an accumulation of issues as rule 10 dictates. Yeah, that's it. That's how I would uh, redraft that. I don't know if you guys heard me. Should I repeat? Yes, please repeat. Okay. Um, I said, uh, as several four states, okay, any allegation of fact made by a party in his certified court certified court documents, rather. Okay, shall be presumed to be admitted by the opposite party unless it is denied by, by him or her in the said certified court documents or an accumulation of issues as Rule 10 dictates. That's it, because there's no need to again repeat uh, the word denial, and yet it's been uh, sort of accommodated in a in a in a in a traverse yes um no um, um i just wanted to contribute kidogo yes uh, with regards to plain english i realized the first uh, the first line contains what we call i think i don't know passive voice and you know when it, I don't know if it's passive or something. This issue where you find the, I don't know the. For instance, uh, when you look at this particular sentence, yeah. Yeah, you yeah, find some I get you. any allegation of fact made by a party in his pleadings. Why can't we change it to uh, a party uh, alleging any any a party alleging any fact? I'm sorry, I don't know how to press it. A party. Uh, alleging any fact in his pleadings shall be blah 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 up to the rest that is what i wanted to contribute in that part yes um um that's okay but you see when it when it when it comes to passive voice um there are also exceptions to uh passive voice so i don't know if that's exactly what this examiner here used 
as an escape to just let this particular rule stand as it is. But let me get some comments from uh, Oduor Wasonga and then Deche. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lavins. I would actually like to follow on the path that uh, Noah was leading us. Yes. And I would just like to attempt. So as uh, as rule as sub rule four states, if a party does not deny facts that the opposite party has alleged in their in their in, in their documents, then the court shall imply that that uh, he or she admits those facts. Well, thanks, but why would you now negate? Because uh, you see, one of the rules of uh, of uh, plain uh, uh, writing is also to avoid negating so much. So when you say it as sub rule four states uh, that uh, a party who who does not deny or what did you say? Wasonga, uh, please just just repeat what you say. There's something I need to capture. Okay, I said uh, if a party does not de deny yeah. facts yeah. that uh, yeah. 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 Party, stop yeah. there. If a party does not deny, does not deny. Okay, so if a party denies, why can't you put it that way? Because if we keep on negating, well, it will uh, sort of, I don't know, uh, lose that um, flavor or substance that the order itself or the rule itself, you know, uh, wants it to remain like. I don't know, but. Uh, I know one of the rules is to avoid negating so much. So, yes, it is. You are trying to make it um, an active a voice, which I do recommend, and I highly commend to you for the same. But we should try to avoid again negating. But uh, yeah, good trial regardless. So let let's listen to Deche, and then we will find a common ground. Yes, uh, Deche. Uh, mine is a question. Uh... I've heard you uh, and Wesonga use the phrase as subrule four states, but if you use that phrase, won't you be changing the meaning of that very first uh, uh, a phrase, subject to rule four? That is a condition, not what subrule four says. So I feel if you say as subrule four states, you'll actually be changing the meaning of the very provision, and that won't accord the very purpose of of why the provision is there in the first place. No, um, you see, subject to is more or less the same thing as pursuant to. You understand? And uh, what we lawyers are taught, you know, is how to reference legislation. But a common man wouldn't understand why should we reference it to a given or existing provision of that particular legislation. You get it. So subject to is just the same as pursuant to. It's only that this particular examiner was only trying to be fair. But it's more or less the same thing. So we are trying to do away with that. It's the same thing as shall be deemed to. You understand? So you have to on both sides. But in other words, we are trying to at least make it as simple as possible. I'll give him this paper and read and say, oh, so sub rule four states this. Regardless, subject to more or less point towards that particular provision. So it wouldn't change a thing or two if we were to sort of do away with it. Yes, um, Odur. Okay, uh, I was I, I actually wanted to suggest something, but I think it would be to the amount of negation, but let me just uh, <laughs> say it nonetheless. Now yes. that I've already brought it up and uh, it is in line with what uh, Deche was saying, yes. maybe. That subject rule four means uh, perhaps it, I, I could uh, replace it as unless a rule four states otherwise because uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think I'm leading to what she's saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, um, I think uh, well at least you have an idea of how we should uh, redraft these provisions, right? That's all that matters. It doesn't matter if we get it right, but get the basics, okay? Do away with the legalese as much as possible and just, yeah, you'll be uh, good to go. The same thing will apply to part two, no close, uh, uh, sub rule two and sub rule three. You get the gist. 
try to understand what words constitute legalese. You can't use plaint, you can't use counterclaim, you can't use um, traverse, okay? So try to make it as simple as possible. So with that, I think you just allow me to go to question four quickly because of time. But I have given you the rules that you need to follow whenever you want to draft a legislation, okay? Or even whatever it is that you want to draft. So Lonka, just quickly, question four. Quickly, um, anyone to read, please, just quickly. This one is an easier question. So question four, just someone to uh, read it. Okay, uh, I will read it. Yes, please, quickly. Uh, use the scenarios below to identify the most convenient form of written communication to use. Draft the said communication, giving reasons why you have chosen this mode of communication. Scenario A, as a junior associate at Mando and Mina Company Advocates, you have had serious disagreements with your boss. He alleges that you never inform him of your whereabouts and you always take too long in the washrooms. He also <laughs> complains <laughs> that you always return from lunch break 20 minutes past the required time. He is particularly angered by the fact that you have not informed him of the, of the Luciana case. Luciana, an old client of Mando and Mina Company Advocates, has had the judge schedule, okay, uh, okay, has had the judge schedule a mention for her case on the on the 8th of June 2017, High Court case number 207 of 2006. The direction was given by the judge at the High Court. At that time, the judge mentioned that the parties to the matter should use the time to prepare themselves as the matter would be heard two weeks after it was mentioned in courts. In court, sorry, five marks. Okay. Uh huh. There is scenario B. Please read. So long as I just uh, scroll upwards. Yes. Uh, Wasonga, please read scenario B. Okay. Scenario B. The law firm of Muga and Company Advocates, where you work, represented by Kamlesh Mwangi in a charge. No, sorry. The, the law firm of Muga and Company Advocates, where you work represented Kamlesh Mwangi in a charge for fraudulent misrepresentation where he had been sued by the Kenya Posters Association. Mr. Mwangi had had business dealings with the Kenya Posters Association for five years and had amassed over 9,000 worth of pages of receipts, licenses, audit records, accounting records, and letters among others. In the pretrial directions, the firm was instructed to furnish all the documents relating to any transactions that Mr. Mwangi had engaged with the Kenya Posters Association. On the day following this directive, you made a call to, to Kenya Posters Association's advocate, and you agreed that you would send the document in two pickups to his office at about 10 a.m. the next day. Because of many years in practice, he or she knows the impropriety of just sending a, dri a driver to deliver documents of this nature. Five marks. So look back to scenario A quickly, and then we could uh, discuss this. Okay, so here, again, the key word there is to identify the most convenient form of written communication to use. So you have to draft the said communication and then give reasons why you have chosen this mode of communication. So what do you think, what's the appropriate form of written communication we can use in scenario A? You as a junior associated Mandu and Mena company advocates, what do you think is the appropriate form of communication we could use? Yes, um, Logan. Uh, just a trial. Uh, yes, below. please. Um, I think uh, I'd go with an internal memo. Perfect. That's it. That's the answer. No other answers, no other um, 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 form of communication. It's an internal memo. Okay. 
because you are briefing the person within the locality or within the presence of that particular working station. And get this, I mean, uh, the examiner will it tell you this person works with you or perhaps no. It's you to know, OK, this is my boss and there's a case that I'm supposed to update him on. So aside from spending you know, too much time in the washrooms and water view, you have to update him on this particular case. That's an internal memo. So you, you, you'll go and read on the benefits of using internal memo. And um, yeah, so uh, that's it. And uh, what do you think could also be uh, other written form of communication to use? But the most appropriate here is just a written internal memo. OK, so you understand, first of all, the benefits of using internal memo, and also you have to gauge this based on the facts that you're given. What does uh, uh, what? Um, I think part B, because part A basically is just an internal memo. So you have to factor in you know, that last part of this particular question, you know, the judge mentioning that the parties uh, to the matter should use the time to prepare themselves as the matter will be hard two weeks after it was mentioned in court. OK. How that's clear. So scenario B say. So look. OK, uh, scenario B, what do you think is the appropriate form of written communication? Anyone? This is quite easier, folks. Scenario B. What is the appropriate form of communication, written communication that you use? Yes, um, Muni Njiru. Um, scenario B. Yeah, you have two external parties in this case in scenario B. So what form of written communication would you use? Very simple. A forwarding letter. Well, uh, interesting. Um, any other trial? Thank you for that. Yeah, um, that will suffice. Any other trial where you have two external parties from different organizations? Um, hold on. I had a question. Yes. For, for the first, I'm sorry for taking you back, but for the first, no um, for the first question scenario A, where could you please go up a little bit so long, Ka? Yeah, this question of the junior associate, there's a time we're having a discussion and um, some of us suggested an internal memo and some others um, suggested a letter. And so we were outvoted, but then the argument at the time was that um, it's the letter is just between an associate, a junior associate and his boss. So I think the the, the interpretation was not to mean I mean, the understanding at the time was that it's like you're meant to apologize to your boss for your tardiness and um, and you know not reporting to him about things that are due. So I don't know what what is your opinion of that? Thank you. I'll answer you, and I would say this again: in each and every question has a trap. Are you seeing where it is written? Still there, where it is written, he is particularly angered. Have you seen that? Yes. Yes, he isn't concerned so much about you spending so much time in the washroom and water view. He is concerned, particularly angered by the fact that you have not informed him of the Luciana case, and you can't do that via letter. So that's the why. That's the reason why we are using an internal memo. Got it? Yes. Yes, Thank that's you. all he needs. The facts of that case, that's all he needs, particularly. So that is the key word. And each and every exam question, please try. And I'm begging you, I'm imploring, and I'm entreating. 
always try to use to look at the trap. What is the trap in this question? So if you didn't identify that word particularly, then and you draft a letter, it will be fatal, unfortunately. So yeah, I hope you are now okay, uh, Moni. So uh, back to our scenario B. What is your response? You said a forwarding letter, yeah, or uh, uh, someone yes. else? Anyone? Hey, folks, anyone? If I could try. <laughs> yes, please. I'm um, thinking of an email. Well, an email. <laughs> uh huh. What is the opposite of an uh, internal memo? A legal opinion. <laughs> yes, but uh, what is the opposite? A letter. Of an Sorry? Just say it. I mean, someone said it. Letter to Wait. opposing counsel. Someone mentioned uh, uh, what I wanted to say. I mean, what's the opposite of an internal memo? Because you have two external parties in. Sorry? I believe a letter. Yes. So the question is, would you use a forwarding letter or you would just use a normal letter? Because those are the only answers that you, that could work here. An email, yes, but you have email perhaps could be just a follow up, but written communication. So could we use now a letter in its uh, natural sense or a forwarding letter? Because the documents that we need to furnish here relating to all those transactions that Mr. Mwangi had engaged with the, with the KPA. Yeah, so what do you folks think? Should we go for forwarding letter or just go with the letter in its natural sense? Yes, um, Logan. Um, I think um, I think I'd go with the forwarding letter because yes. uh, forwarding letters are used where you have documents, for example, documents to accompany the, which are a bit uh, voluminous in nature perfect well folks there you have it so you'd use a forwarding letter you know i mean all these things with it only needs your key concentration it's very easy to pass the by exams it's your concentration that is needed you know someone else will read all these things and get tired already the mind is tired and then the answer is very simple you've overthought you've overthought but you don't have to crack the mind for you to think too hard so it's 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 a it's a forwarding letter, and the reason stated is particularly that because this question the examiner wants us to give exactly our reasons for the same. Thank you, um, uh, Logan. So I think we'll move to question five quickly. So Lonka, if you if you could scroll upwards, please. Uh, Vince, perhaps as uh, so Lonka scrolls. Yes. Yeah, I would just like to inquire on uh, the exact issue we'd be addressing here. Yes. Considering that, uh, uh, like, is that is that last bit on uh, that question scenario B irre yes. irrelevant necessarily about the lawyer talking about the impropriety of uh, perhaps just sending sending the driver to leave. Well, I don't know if it was made to have any uh, substance or any effect on the particular question, but what did you have in mind? I mean, what informed your opinion on the same um, with Songa? Can you hear me with Songa? Yes, eh? actually, Somebody removed me. I think they're not very fond of my question, but I'll proceed nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll proceed. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah, I was just asking, what, what is the focus of this question essentially? Because there are those details at the very end that I think are just throwing me off uh, concerning uh, the on the issue of the impropriety. Is that is, is that just uh, something designed to just send us off track, or what essentially is its purpose in this question? 
Well, perhaps it is it is it is only meant to uh, make you question what is now what could be the appropriate mode of uh, delivering the same, given that you have a driver who's who's perhaps you know never he's never or she has never sort of lived up to his, the expectations of the external party. So yeah, I mean you try to suggest uh, the appropriate means of delivery, but at the end of the day, those documents have to reach the particular party concern. So it's up to you to, to decide on the mode of delivery. Okay, and uh, just a quick follow up. Yes. Uh, so now, because now we are told now to draft the said communication, in this yes. instance, uh, what would be the issue that you'd be, you'd be highlighting in this one? In that, issue in, that in terms of what? Uh, because, uh, okay, from the question at the very top, it is uh, draft the said communication giving yes. reasons why you have chosen this mode of communication. So essentially you're supposed to, in addition to giving reasons, you're supposed to draft. And, and in this yes. one, I think I'm a bit conflicted as to the, yeah, the contents of that in this instance. Well, like uh, Logan said, uh, um, 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 the reason is when you sort of uh, do want to set bodies of documents and whatever view of forwarding letters should be appropriate. But now when it comes to the content on that particular letter, then you'll have to change now the means of uh, delivery because like you've said the last part of this particular question talks about the years of impropriety you know and it's are sending a driver to deliver the documents of this nature so you have to find a way of trying to tilt and adjust the tides so that you could at the end of the day ensure all these documents get to the external party do you now understand Okay, I'm still processing. I think we'll pursue this further. <laughs> okay, on. fine. Uh, you know, you know where to find me. Okay. Um, uh, question five. Quickly. Anyone to read? Uh, Solonka, please scroll upwards. Thank you. So this one, I think we should uh, we should take seconds in them. So question five. Someone to read it quite quickly. Yes, uh, okay. Hope you can hear me. I can. Yes, please proceed. Each of the following sentences offends the basic rules of good legal writing. Edit and rewrite them accordingly. Uh, yeah. So do I read the question? Yes, 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 proceed. Okay. Uh, Part one, a junior employee may petition the foreman attaching to his complaint a copy of his contract of service. Then the nation suffers when leaders loot the public coffers or by killing their own citizens. Three, we lost the case due to the fact that our advocates did not prepare adequately. Four, I do not quite understand why the judge ruled against our client. Five, if it was insisted by Dr. Wafula that the contract had been breached by the welfare hospital. Uh, six, the players made a decision to enter into an agreement with their old club. And seven, it is important to note that we recommend plain English in drafting the legal documents. Then uh, eight, it is illegal to file documents in court without a practice certificate. Then nine, the applicant has denied ever witnessing a formation contract. Then 10, the final outcome of the disagreement was first and foremost the dissolution of the company. Well, folks, Thank you, um, Magero. Well, folks, all these, all these, I mean, this part is always free marks. So quickly, I mean, the first part, a junior employee may petition the foreman attaching to his complaint a copy of his contract of service. Quickly, anyone to redraft? Hey, folks. Yes, Muturi. Yes, thank you. A, a junior employee may petition the foreman by attaching to his complaint a copy of his contract of service. So what? I'll add the word by. You'll add the word what? By to connect these two. There are two sentences. So I'll connect them by adding 
uh, the, the, the word by, by attaching. Thank you. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's something called connecting factors. I mean, oh my God, you guys, uh, try, try to revise, I mean, the rule and art of plain English. There's connecting factors or connecting words. So yeah, I mean, uh, you can try to connect those two sentences with those connecting factors to make it quite sound, okay? So, um, the nation suffers when leaders lose the public office, or, uh, no, but I think we could also address it in a different way, that part one. Yes, Otieno? Uh, I was thinking, we introduced yes. the concept of uh, gender neutrality, where by, yes. uh, we can say a junior employee may petition the foreman uh, by attaching their complaint uh by attaching by attaching uh their complaint a copy of their contract of service yeah i mean a junior employee may petition foreman that is also not gender neutral is it uh yeah 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 it's not so, yeah so uh, you have to so, also look at that huh? okay so you uh, have two uh, words that are that are gender insensitive i don't know i mean uh what the because for a woman let, really no i mean there is uh let, there's a word for that say, uh, i forgot I, the I word don't know. Uh, can you yes, say yes. four person four one? person <laughs> i don't know but there is a word for that i have just forgotten yes so Foreman is gender insensitive. You have his again, that's gender insensitive. He's again gender insensitive. So replace that, those two there, and then foreman get to find the gender neutral word for it. So part two, the nation suffers when leaders. Uh, sorry, Lavins. Yes. Uh, can we use the term supervisor instead of foreman? Yeah, could be because foreman or oh, well, uh, four persons or whichever. These are persons in charge of, uh, you know, um, Others, perhaps, you know, could be a site, could be a farm, could be where. Yeah, so yeah, it could be supervisor, but at the end of the day, you try to find the word that does befit the stature and character of that particular sentence so that you don't end up, you don't end up annoying the marker. If the marker is a woman in this particular case, you never know. So that's it. So just find the words that are gender neutral and you're good to go. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, uh, excuse me. Magaira? Yes, just a question or rather a clarification. I mean, Miss Kongo's class and when it, that second part of attaching to his complaint. So uh, my colleague, I think Mr. Otieno said there, she advised that uh, we'll maybe uh, avoid using there to just so, so as not to so as not to mess up that sentence in case it's in we put, would put it in plural if we use there. So she advised that when we have his or maybe has, you can use the just the phrase his or has, his or her complaint instead of using there. I don't know. Uh, I stand guided also, but just quoting from Miss Kongo's class. Well, um, that one would be ideal, but at the same time, it's it will be a cake in that you'll keep on repeating, you know, attaching to his or her complaint again. You repeat the same thing. His or contract of uh, well, could be you use either his or her in the first part and then use there on the other part. Yeah, at least to try and balance the two. Lavins. Yes. I am in Miss Kungu's class, yes. class B, and she specifically yes. told us. To achieve gender neutrality, you always use plural, not singular. Yes. So okay, that's so, it's contradicting so that what there. the last speaker just said. So that means we will still use there. Yeah. Well, okay. So long as at the end of the day, both of you just try to find a gender neutral term. I think we are now good. So part two, who can give me, who, who, who can uh, rewrite uh, that part? The nation suffers when leaders lose the public coffers or by killing their own citizens. Who can you drive this? Quickly. Hey, people. 
if okay, wrong, please stop try. me. Yes. The nation suffers whenever leaders loot the public coffers and ki and kill their own citizens. Mm hmm. Good trial. Uh, anyone? Yes, Yusuf. Uh, the nation suffers when leaders uh, steal public funds and killing their citizens. Great. Yes, coffers is quite legalese, so I think you will try to omit that. Yeah, um, good stuff. Yeah, anyone else? Yeah, loot as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still may be quite convenient uh, to the uh, layman. Yeah. Anyone else, people? Um, I have a question. Yes, is please. It, um, by killing their own citizens or its own citizens or its citizens? Well, uh, thank you for pointing that out. I will uh, revert. Uh, yes, Daniel. Yeah, I wanted to add that. I think if you use their own, that is repetitive. So just use their or its citizens. The last part. You say their own, what does it mean? I'm saying yes. if you say their own, it's like saying my own car. The fact that you've said it's your car, that's enough. You don't have to say your own. So you can just say my car. So it's the same way they can say their citizens without saying their own citizens. Well, I, uh, I I do understand, and uh, and uh, leaders don't uh, possess the citizens. It's it's the nation that you know uh, possess its citizens. Yeah, that one also. Yeah, it's quite ideal. So while well, yeah, having in uh, incorporated those two uh, or those amendments, then I think you could redraft that part too. So um, part three. We lost the case due to the fact that our advocates did not prepare adequately quickly. Anyone? Yes, uh, Jane. Jane Pombo. Hey, Jane, are you here? Jane, I can't hear you. I don't know. Have we lost it? Well, uh, Candy? We lost the case because our advocates did not prepare adequately. Simple, concise, and accurate. Yes, so due to the fact it's archaic and legalese, you have to omit it. So you replace that with because. We lost the case because our advocates did not prepare Adequately. Good. Part four. I do not quite understand why the judge ruled against our client. Anyone? Yes. If, before we go to the next one, yes. Uh, before I attempt yeah. the, the the next one, can can the so can we say that uh, we lost the case because our advocate was unprepared? Will that no. be okay? Advocates are quite a number here, so wars wouldn't even suffice. Okay. Yeah, so I think what um, Candy said, that one is the right I think. but good trial regardless, thanks. So part four, uh, please answer. Would you read? Oh, part four, I yes. don't... I, I don't quite... And I, I okay, I don't understand the judgment against our, our client. I don't no. understand the, the judgment against our client. Well, uh, yes, good trial. Logans, you want to say something? Um, I thought maybe what if we replace the word uh, the words do not with uh, did not? Because I I, I I tend to understand the sentences in past tense. So it becomes, um, I did not understand why the judge ruled against our client. Mm. Just a try. Okay, yes. Um, anyone else?
Anyone else? Uh, hello. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Who is that speaking? Uh, it's Mark. I just yes. had a question. Can it be phrased like a question now? Because it can be just, uh, why did the judge rule against our client? Could it become a question? Well, a question uh, mark at the end. Well, uh, mm, no, it can't. It's as expressive as it is. So changing perhaps how the structure should be would uh, perhaps render it, you know, perhaps um, not, it won't have that strength as it does right now as a sentence. So yeah, but a good trial, thank you. So yeah, I mean, in other words, you guys, uh, the word quiet is unnecessary there. So you can say the judgment against our client, but you know, even magistrates give out judgment. So I think you would still try to wait. How about um should the word judge be in capital? Capital J. Should it be in capital J? Hey, people. Not necessarily. I don't think so because it does not include the name. If if um if it were judge so longer then probably they would have put capital, but it's just no. the term judge. But. Yes, I get that point, but um the sentence itself is a. Uh, how can I put it? It's 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 um <laughs> it's it's uh I'm lacking the word for it. But regardless, huh? Well, because it, the name of the judge doesn't appear, maybe it should still remain that way, but um so there is a... Uh, These are the question of reason by that word why. So the word quite shouldn't even be there. It's 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 a uh, it brings bottom. So I mean you don't have to create that emphasis. So yeah, more or less the same. I think I would uh, try to manipulate it a little bit. Because uh, it's not a question at the end of the day, so we can't change the structure and put a question mark at the end. Um, it's more or less appealing for appealing to know the reason why the judge ruled against um, the client. Okay. So, but five, perhaps what you guys should do. Again, question five is too hanging. Okay. Um, if it was insisted by Dr. Wafule that the contract had been breached, huh? Yeah. Yes. Uh, before before Logan's, let me let me pick Caroline first. Um, Dr. Wafule insisted that Welfare Hospital dishonored the contract. Yes, because this is passive, so you are trying to have an inverse of the same. So you will use an active voice to try um, and make it make sense. OK, thank you, uh, Caroline. Yes, Logans. Uh, sorry to take you back, uh, PLO. I have a question. Yes. Uh, it's just a question uh, on uh, part three. Yes. Um, could we say it as um, um, instead of putting a connector? Uh, or the word because we can say, um, can we say our advocates did not prepare adequately? Full stop. We lost the case. Full stop. Can it be that way? Yes, yes, perfect. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, you, you could demand those two sentences because the the reason why you lost the case, it, it, it was because of the unpreparedness by your advocates. So, yeah, that will still suffice. I do agree 100%. Thank you. Wesonga, yes. Okay, I would, uh, I actually wanted to register my disagreement with that. Eh? Yes. Because, yeah, because uh, now it is, uh, because I think uh, the guiding uh, thought process, it, it should be that uh, we are looking at uh, the problem in the sentence. So that we, the first step is we look at what, what is the problem and then we resolve it. Such, such that I don't think uh, this uh, sentence is too, is long enough to warrant dividing it into two parts. It doesn't hurt to fly because um, you, 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 at the end of the day, you will convey the message. Because the fact that I couldn't even uh, use the word because, because because itself is more or less a connecting factor. And that should tell you that there are two sentences that you could break in between. You get it. So if I said, you know, our advocates did not prepare adequately, full stop. We lost the case. That's fine. Because at the end of the day, the reason why we used because is we, we were trying to connect both sentences. Do you now agree with me or you will still register your decision? Well, I, I would, uh, yeah, I will still stay with that. And I, I understand that position, but I would be more cautious with that approach. <laughs> Uh, excuse me, Solonka. I'm, I'm not sure if it's just on my side, uh, but I can't hear Lavins. I, I think there's a problem because my network, my network connectivity is also problematic. It's disappearing. It's coming and going. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Solonka. Uh, Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. It's network, but it's really pretty. It's a really pretty. Late. Have you guys finished? I think Lavin has dropped off. Oh. <clears throat> Let me see. Maybe we can begin from uh, next week because I know it's a bit pretty late. My attention span has actually started uh, becoming low. Well, what do you guys suggest? Uh, is Lapin's back? I'm seeing him in the meeting, but I can't. Uh... Lapin, are you in? How about you now? Are you in?
Amin. Ah. Nila pinsa ba patia? Pero what do you guys suggest? Do we call it a night then uh, touch base next week or? Uh... Yes. Yes, we, we can. Yes. Hey, Tad, personally. It's in order for me. <laughs> ah, it's okay. So hopefully at least you've uh, gotten a glimpse of LWD and uh, how it is and uh, how you revise for, for it, how you pay keen attention to detail and the little specifics. So next week we'll do uh, no, what what will you what will you what what will you do next week? Criminal. criminal. Oh, you want us to do criminal? Okay. Yes, please. No? Yes, please. Uh, uh, criminal litigation, huh? Yes. Yes. Okay, no worries. We'll prepare on that and then the other week we do profit. So I think that's it. So we'll Touch base next week. We'll do criminal litigation. I'll send the paper. Um, no, we'll take you through it. Well, okay, all of us will be here basically, and then uh, hopefully we'll all be well. So criminal is one of the tricky units. Also, very technical, very technical paper. I don't know what happens, but criminal has been has been harder and harder as the years come and go. So we'll do next. We'll do it next week, and then. Uh, and then I'll see. But for criminal, the hack is just read the bench book, judiciary bench book, and you'll be good to go. So, no, unless you have, and I don't know, maybe you can uh, give a few remarks and then we'll, we'll call it a night. As for me, I'm hey, uh, hey, uh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, sorry. I call drops, but regardless, uh, I think we are not wrapping up. So, yeah, um, it's been a great session. I've enjoyed doing this and uh, if you still have any concerns on the same on LWD, I'll be glad to help and my team will still be here to try and uh, uh, scrutinize the kind of questions you have. And like I said, we have a busy, I mean, a week from Monday to Friday, workload here and there, but I always try to respond at the earliest convenience. So um, don't, uh, uh, um, don't worry when we respond late, but what matters is we always respond. We may just forget, but keep reminding us. Yes, all the best again in your in your journey, and I wish you the best. And I will still repeat this, but if you don't believe in yourself, I do believe in you, and you have what it takes to gather nine Ps. So what matters is great grace and gratitude. And you're home and dry. So yeah, you have a good night, and I'll see you again next week, inshallah. Thank you, Solonke. Nah, thank you, thank you, Lavins. Thank you, Lavins. So how about you know? Then we actually close it up for us now. Uh, evening, I have nothing to add. What what went was so me. You know, tricky of Peter Sealy, so me. You too, choir my church. Okay, have a, have a good night, everyone. To Tasoma. <laughs> 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 All right. So long. I'll stop the. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Great. Right. Have a blessed.